handouts from the Google Drive link. And we're recording. <laughs> uh, let me know if you do have any issues with accessing the handouts. So let's get started. In this workshop, we'll cover various topics such as the importance of integrated pest management, IPM, so you have a better understanding of why you're scouting, like why it's so important, um, disease causal agents, um, characteristics, symptoms, and damages of different insects and mites, um, scouting for weeds in horticultural crops, pesticide safety, soil diagnostics, um, invasive species, and farm visit biosecurity. So this is an introdu introductory course that covers the basic information that you need to know. The OMAFRA also has other scouting workshops, um, which, you, which will build on this information that you're learning today, and it's tailored to specific crops. Um, you can register for those workshops through the On Vegetables or On Fruit blogs, which you probably use to register for um, this workshop, so you probably already know about those. Um, if you forget where to find it, I did include um, those links to those blogs and your contact information and other resources um, handout that I provided to you in the email that you should have got yesterday. So I hope everyone had a chance to listen to the 20 minute video on scouting for weeds, because um, Kristen will be covering a review of that later on today. If you are a certified crop advice, advisor, unfortunately CEUs are not in place for this session, but we are happy to supply the information um, so you can apply for those yourself. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, please don't share your screen <laughs> and, and mute yourself unless you're asking a question or making a comment. Um, as you just heard, um, this, um, this session is being recorded. Um, you can keep your camera on if you wish, um, but you can turn it off if you don't want to, and sometimes this can help with internet connection. Um, we are going to use Slido, as you um, saw if you logged on early enough, um, we did have one question so far. Um, so we're hoping to ask some questions during the workshop today to keep you engaged. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, so you can do that by clicking on, there should be a react button, reaction button, and um, you can raise your hand through that way, or you can um, mute yourself um, and um, show your camera, and then you can ask your question that way or type it in the chat, and we'll monitor for that. Okay. And where did my, I have too many screens going here. Okay. So here's the agenda today that you would have got in your handouts. And we'll have a 20 or a 10 minute break in the morning and afternoon and a 30 minute lunch to break up the day and give you some time to move around, grab some meat, have a bio break. And after today's workshop, I will send out a short survey. Um, we do appreciate you answering this. It will tell us how we did and it'll help us to improve. So we really do um, like that feedback. And so here's our lineup of speakers for today's workshop. Um, Hopefully everyone has their camera on. <laughs> um, I don't know if everyone wants to introduce themselves or I'll just go through it. Um, we had Tejendra Shem Shepagain, um, our soil fertility specialist, and Verhollen, our soil management specialist, Hannah Fraser, our entomologist for horticultural crops, Katie Goldenhar, a plant pathologist for horticultural crops, and my tech support today. Um, Elizabeth Buck from Cornell will be joining us later. She's the fresh market vegetable specialist. Um, Kristen Obeid, our weed management specialist for horticultural crops, and myself, Denise Beaton, the crop protection specialist. And so now I'll just start off with the first presentation. It's a short one, why IPM is important. So IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. And there are various pests that can affect or attack crops. So some people think of insects when they hear pests, but it's a term that we can use more broadly to include other types of pests. So when we're talking about um, pests of plants today, we are going to include insects, nematodes, weeds, plant pathogens, and wildlife, even though we're not gonna really touch on wildlife um, issues today. So, when we say integrated pest management or IPM, what do we really mean? 
So IPM is a decision-making process that uses all necessary techniques to suppress pests effectively, economically, and in an environmentally sound manner. <clears throat> it is based on research. And another way to say it is it's an approach to pest control that considers all management options to maintain pests below an economic injury level. With IPM, adverse effects of pesticides are minimized and economic returns are retained or maintained. Um, there are different ways that growers can manage pests. So there are biological methods. So you can promote beneficial insects and mites. Um, there are also cultural methods. So um, how you choose your site, um, what field you plant certain crops in, um, crop rotation. So if you have a nematode issue or a soil borne pathogen issue that can reside in soil for a few years, um, rotating out of susceptible crops um, would be a good management solution. Um, using resistant varieties um, to certain diseases, using certified seeds. So you're starting out with clean seed that is free from viruses or other type of plant pathogens. Planting dates, um, you can adjust those somewhat um, to try and miss the window when certain soil borne insects or whatever could be in the soil. That's just an example. Um, sanitation, so um, cleaning up infested um, plant material, um, things like that to help um, reduce the, the inoculum or the pest pressure. And changing irrigation practices, so something like um, the disease downy mildew that thrives with leaf, leaf wetness. Um, so just making sure you're tying in irrigation so you're not having prolonged leaf, leaf wetness can help um, manage those issues as well. There's also mechanical methods. So physical removal, like taking out weeds um, or a diseased um, plant, like roguing that out, using mulches um, that can be used to help suppress weed issues. Um, using screens and nettings to keep out certain insects and birds, um, steam sterilization of soils that can help reduce like um, the incidence of certain um, soil-borne plant pathogens. And then there's chemical methods. So the use of pesticides or another term used is pest control products. So IPM programs make um, extensive use of information collecting and cropping systems and requires careful management by the grower. So to implement an IPM program, it requires knowledge and understanding of five basic components. So the first one is identification. You need to be able to properly identify the weed, plant pathogen, insect nematode, whatever the pest is that um, could be affecting that crop. And the grower really needs to know what is causing the problem in order to be able to know what management tactics they need to use. It's also important to understand the life stages of pests and the damage caused by these pests and to understand its biology and behavior. It's also important to know what natural enemies, beneficial insects and pollinators are present. Um, for example, like natural enemies can help keep certain pests under control, such as the ladybird beetle or ladybugs. They can help suppress soybean aphid populations and soybean production. So number two is monitoring. So using appropriate monitoring techniques for various pests and crops that you scout. Um, also, it's good, um, uh, also good record keeping is very important. Uh, each time you visit a field, you'll be recording information like the stage of crop development, disease severity, population levels of insect pests and beneficials, damage observed, things like that. Um, so it's a good idea to keep a field map and record the location of the damage. You may be scouting a lot of fields in a day and you won't be able to remember all this information. You think you will, but you won't. <laughs> it's a lot of information. So it's important to record your observations. Number three is to know the economic thresholds for um, pests if they do exist, exist, which will help with um, management decisions. So when maybe a pesticide is required. Uh, number four, methods of control, the use and timing of appropriate management tools, um, also resistance management um, strategies and sprayer calibration. And number five, evaluation is very important. A grower needs to know if their methods of controls are working or not. And, uh, then they, and if they're not working, then they need to reevaluate what they're doing. 
So for skips that, like your students, you won't be making recommendations to growers on what they should be spraying, but your accurate recorded observations, like your eyes on the ground, are critical for the grower to make an informed decision when it comes to pe their pest management program. And so this is just a slide that's um, from Stern, it's um, from 1959. Um, so it's just showing that thresholds are a critical part of an IPM program. So when scouting um, some levels of pests like insects are and their damage will always be observed. However, not all situations will result in yield loss. So thresholds are levels of pest damage or, or injury or insect numbers that will result in yield loss beyond the cost of a remedial action. So usually spraying with a pesticide. So in other words, the density of a pest has reached a point at which a management intervention, in this case, a pesticide application is economically justified. So control measures applied at a threshold are meant to prevent the pest from reaching the economic injury level. So I don't know if you can see here. Um, so that's the, the top blue line. So the economic injury level is the lowest pest population, which will cause economic damage. Um, some crops have very little tolerance for injury, in which case the action threshold, so the bottom um, <laughs> line um, and the injury, uh, economic injury level are low. Um, so the thresholds may change depending on the crop, the variety and the um, stage of crop development. So scouting is key to successful IPM. So you need to communicate your monitoring results clearly, timely, and accurately, or else a grower may miss a window of opportunity to use a control method or may use one when not needed. Also, you should not share another grower's scouting information with another grower. This should be kept confidential between you, your employer, and the grower. And so just to recap why, on um, why IPM is important. Um, so the grower is aware of potential crop management problems. Um, you control pests only when needed. So this will reduce um, the number of app pesticide applications. Also, you'll have accurate timing of those pest management tactics. You'll minimize crop losses and reduce risk to the environment and people, reduce risk of um, resistance development and good record keeping. It's just a good idea. It's due diligence. So um, you can go to our own Malford Crop IPM web website to get more information on pest management, so diagnostics for most crops that we grow in Ontario. So there's the link there. It's also, um, this presentation's in your handout, so you can um, refer to that if you miss some of the links. Um, it would be a good idea for you to subscribe to our vegetable and fruit blogs, depending on what crops you are gonna be scouting this year. Um, so you can get timely information on pests and pest management. If you are scouting other crops, such as um, specialty crops, greenhouse crops, um, tree nuts, we also have blogs for those as well. And that's included in your handout. Um, our vegetable specialists um, produce the vegetable crop report, which is a weekly update that includes crop updates, weather, growing degrees summaries um, for various vegetable growing regions across Ontario. And here's just an example, our OMAFRA specialist produced fire blight prediction maps as well. So just to show another example of information available on our blogs. And also, um, I believe they're still gonna do this. Um, if you're um, doing a lot of driving this summer, so you may be interested in listening to what's growing on podcasts at OMAFRA host. So that's it for me. And I believe Katie's up next with disease causal agents. Yeah, thanks, Denise. Uh, I will start to share my screen and just yell at me if there's any issues. Otherwise, I'll assume it's all good. Okay, I have you for a whole 45 minutes to talk about diseases. Uh, hold on, I'll just swap my display. Give me a second, my computer is very slow right now. Uh, 
So if you haven't joined Slido already, I'm going to do a before and after type presentation um, or type questions just so, uh, you know, I can kind of prove that you've learned something through uh, through through our session here. So uh, first of all, my name is Katie Goldenhar. I am the pathologist for horticulture crops uh, with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, and I'm based in Guelph, Ontario. And so what my position entails is uh, monitoring and looking for, you know, working with specialists on different disease issues in Ontario and horticulture crops. So it's quite varied. We have a lot of horticulture crops. Uh, and so the job is always interesting. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to this field season and to getting to even talk and meet with some of you when it comes to disease issues in horticulture crops. So the first question I want to know is just how familiar you are with plant diseases. So I'm going to launch that now. So again, log into slido.com and the event code is intro to IPM. So I just want to know there's no right or wrong answer. It's just how familiar are you when it comes to diseases? Okay, all right. Awesome. Yeah, so lots with just some basic biology work, some with a little bit, and that's awesome because you know there's lots of basic stuff in here that'll be a really good foundation if you're uh, taking any of the other crop specific uh, courses just to kind of get an intro to plant diseases and kind of what causes them. Uh, okay, so I'm going to move on to the next question is what do diseases need to occur? So is it a pathogen or the causal agent? So kind of the title of this top, top, top <laughs> topic. Uh, is it a favorable environment, a susceptible host or all of the above? So I'll just give you a couple more seconds there. If you could answer that on Slido, it should be on your phone or on a different tab. Good, getting some good participation. Okay, awesome. I think we're gonna move to the next question. Um, so the next question is, a blank is the plant's expression of an infection. So is it a sign, a symptom, disease, or you're not sure? Someone just asked in the chat if you could mention the code. It's intro to IPM. Okay, we are going to move on to the next question. So what is a sign of a bacterial disease? Is it water soaking, smelly, soft rotting, ooze, or what is the sign? Okay, we're getting some answers. And yeah, it's normal that you can't see the responses. I just, uh, we're gonna keep this as a base and then we're gonna go over the answers at the end um, after the presentation is over once yeah, we learn some of these things. Okay, the next question is, what is a common symptom of powdery mildew? So I'm gonna launch the next one. So the water soaking on leaves, black growth on the underside of leaves, white growth on the top of the leaf or angular necrotic lesions. So what is a common symptom of powdery mildew? Mm, yeah, most people are getting this one. That's awesome. Although it's kind of good if you get the wrong answer now and then you know you get it later and I can show that you learned something, but <laughs> powdery mildew is uh, one of those easier diseases to identify. Uh, okay, next question, and we only have a few more. Which disease is caused by the water mold group of pathogens? Is it smut, rust, club root, downy mildew, or powdery scab? Give you a bit of time to answer that one. Not enough time to Google the answer. Okay. 
Okay. Next question is, all plant parasitic nematodes have what in common? Is it females lose their eel-like shape of maturity? They have a stylet. They are not, they are economically damaging to all crops or you're not sure. So what do all plant parasitic nematodes have in common? And if you have no idea what a nematode is, don't worry, we'll go over that. Okay, and one more question before we get into the presentation is, viruses cannot reproduce outside of a host. Is this true or false? So you got a 50-50 chance here if you have no idea. Viruses cannot reproduce outside of a host. Is that statement true or false? Okay, awesome. I am going to stop the polling there. Thank you very much um, for your responses. And we'll come back to those questions at the end once we've kind of gone through some of this stuff. So the first thing that I think is really important to cover is what is a disease? So when it comes to plant diseases, the definition is the malfunctioning of the growth of a plant caused by repeated irritation of a causal agent that results in symptoms. And so we're gonna go over what are causal agents that can cause plant diseases, but the disease itself is actually just the malfunctioning of the growth caused by repeated irritation. When it comes to symptoms, symptoms are the plant's expression of an infection. So something like a wilt is a symptom because that pathogen is in the roots of that plant and causing it to uh, you know, not be able to get water or nutrients up into that plant and it's wilting. And so that is a symptom of the infection. So it's the plant responding to the infection from that causal agent. Signs are the actual living organism or a byproduct of that organism. So signs are something that's really useful when you want to accurately diagnose a disease, but sometimes they're really challenging to see because these are microorganisms. But signs are something like for bacterial pathogen, you have ooze, and that ooze is an actual byproduct of that organism and is a really good way to tell if it's actually caused by bacteria or some other abiotic uh, abiotic factor. So in order to get disease, uh, what you need is three different things. You need the host, the pathogen, or the causal agent, and the environment. So without one of these three things, you do not get disease. And so what I mean by host is you have a apple tree that might be susceptible to some apple pathogens, but if you know a uh, corn rust lands on an apple, it's not a susceptible host, so it's not gonna cause disease. So you need a susceptible host. The other thing you need is the environment. So you need the environment to be conducive in order for infection to occur. So right now, depending on where you are, it's cool and it's wet. And so a lot of pathogens really need a lot of moisture in order to actually infect a crop. Luckily, a lot of crops, when it comes to annual crops, they're not in the field yet. And so we're not really worrying about that favorable environment at this point. And the last part you need is the pathogen. And so that's where we're going to spend most of today talking about is the actual causal agent. So the pathogen, the fungi, the bacteria, the viruses that are needed in order to cause disease. But I think it's really important to know that just because you might have a bacteria present does not necessarily mean you're going to get disease. You need the right environment. And so that's when disease forecasting and some of the other things Denise mentioned when it comes to manipulating the environment can really help reduce the actual disease that shows up in a crop. So this is what we're going to go over. We're going to go over plant disease causal agents. They're also known as pathogens, um, and they can be caused by the micro and macro organisms in all biological kingdoms. So we have the kingdom Monaria, which has bacteria and phytoplasmas, which are plant pathogens. We have the kingdom Chromista, which has omycetes, which are a type of plant pathogen. We have the fungi kingdom, which I think is the most well known when it comes to pathogens. Um, and that includes our mushrooms, our molds, our mildews. We're very familiar um, with fungi when it comes to causing diseases. 
Nematodes, which I discussed in one of those questions, are actually belonging to the Animalia kingdom. Um, and so those are really, really tiny animals, which is really interesting. Um, there are plant uh, parasitic plants, so they belong to the plant kingdom, um, that can actually cause disease you know, by repeatedly bothering and irritating that plant. Uh, and then we have protozoa, uh, protozoa organism, which we refer to as the slime molds. Uh, so something like club root, which we'll go over, uh, but that belongs to a different kingdom. And then we also have non-living genetic material and proteins such as viruses that can also cause disease. So we're going to start with bacteria. So again, this belongs to the kingdom Monaria, and there are over 100 known species that are pathogenic to plants. So bacteria are very simple organisms. They're single cell rods, spherical, spiral, filamentous shaped microorganisms. So they're very small, very simple, but they reproduce really, really, really quickly through simple fission. And that can make them very damaging when it comes to being a plant disease, especially when those conditions are conducive. So again, they're very destructive. Uh, and sometimes, like I mentioned, they produce this bacterial ooze, which is an actual sign of the disease. And that's a really good way to tell that it's caused by a bacteria is this ooze because it's producing millions and millions of bacterial spores or bacterial cells within that ooze. And that's a really good way for it to transfer its, uh, its material. So some examples of diseases caused by bacteria in Ontario, uh, one really common one in apples and pears is fire blight. So it's caused by the bacteria Erwinia amylivora. Um, and so it can cause blossom blight, shoot blight, uh, it can cause uh, uh, cankers within that tree, and it can be really devastating if it's not controlled. And so you can see here on this picture, uh, this little ooze droplet. And so that's a really good way to say, yeah, that's caused by a bacteria. And one of the most common ones in apples is, uh, is causing fire blight. So another common one is halo blight on snap beans. Uh, so you can see it's very aptly named. It causes this halo, uh, halo like shape. And so it's yellow. It's eventually going to become necrotic. Um, so that's when the tissue dies and turns brown. Uh, but you can see that it kind of starts out as this yellow halo around a lesion. Um, a common one in strawberries is angular leaf spot. So this is caused by a bacteria. And what you can see on the underside of the leaf, especially if you hold it up to the light, is you see these kind of window panes. And so that's like, it's just darkening. So we call that water soaking. And it causes these angular lesions, which look like, like panes on a window. Um, and so eventually those will turn kind of necrotic and you can get this severe blighting on the leaves. Um, but that's a very common one in strawberries. And then there's a different bacteria that causes the similar disease. It's the same name. It's called angular leaf spot in cucurbits. Um, and so you can see a few pictures here, very similar symptoms. So on the bottom of the leaf, uh, you got that water soaking, that window painting. Uh, and then eventually on the top of the leaf, you'll start to see some of the, um, the lesions turn necrotic and chlorotic, and eventually it can cause some severe, severe leaf blighting. Uh, and then the last bacterial disease I'll talk about is soft rot. So soft rot is a big problem in a lot of storage crops. It's caused by a lot of different bacteria, but it really causes this soft, smelly rot um, that can spread very quickly. Because if you imagine those bacteria are reproducing within that soft, smelly, you know, really favorable host environment in storage, and those can then spread to others. Um, you know, again, if you have that favorable environment. So I have some pictures of some onions and some potatoes here with some soft rot. So the next causal agent I want to talk about is phytoplasma. So they also belong to the kingdom Monaria. So they belong to the same kingdom as bacteria, but they are different. So they were often referred to as bacteria till we get a better understanding of what they were. Um, they actually have no cell wall. So sometimes they're referred to as naked bacteria. And they're only found in the phloem of host plants. And so they're not known to actually be able to survive in any crop residue or outside of the host. But the way that they're spread is through insect hosts. And so, you know, the insect is feeding on a plant, it's feeding on that phloem, it's able to get this phytoplasma and then transfer it to other crops or to other plants. Um, and so you can see some of the typical symptoms there. We'll go over some pictures on the next slide. 
The most common one here is aster yellows. And so this is, um, this is transmitted vectored by the leaf hopper. Um, and so, you know, when that leaf hopper is sucking on that plant, it is able to then transfer this phytoplasma to the next plant that it feeds on and so on and so on. You can see it has a very wide host range. Uh, so there's some symptoms here on strawberries, on carrots and on celery. And so it's called aster yellows because in a lot of cases you'll have this yellowing of the crop. Um, and you know, it can also cause these malformations of growth. So this was supposed to be a flower, um, but because of this phytoplasma, it uh, has this vegetative growth instead. So the next one we'll talk about is fungi. Um, so fungi are molds, rust, mildews, mushrooms, toadstools. And there's over 10,000 known species that are pathogenic to plants. They belong to four different phyla. Um, so this is kind of your basic, your basic plant pathology. Um, the two main ones that we have diseases from are Ascomycota and Basidiomycota. Um, but you know, there is a lot of fungi that can infect plants, which is why we're so familiar with them. Uh, so the fungi, they lack chlorophyll and they reproduce by sexual or asexual, uh, asexual spores um, or canidia as they're often called when it comes to ascomy ascomycetes. Um, so some do produce unique structures or signs such as sclerotia or fruiting bodies. So depending on the disease you're looking at, there can be really good ways to be able to accurately diagnose uh, if they produce some sort of fruiting body because they're typically larger than the spores themselves. So some common fungal diseases that we have here in Ontario. Uh, the first one is white mold. So this is caused by, uh, by the fungi sclerotinia sclerotium. And it has a very wide host range. Uh, it, has, it can infect beans, tomatoes, cabbage, carrots, celery. And so it produces, uh, it produces these fruiting bodies uh, called these sclerotia, which overwinter in the soil. Then come the spring, it produces these, these ascospores that are released into the canopy and can spread there. And then, you know, this cycle can continue into the next crop. Um, so that's a pretty common one with a wide host range. And if you ever scouted soybeans or you know a lot about soybeans, this can also infect soybeans. Uh, so the next one when it comes to horticultural diseases caused by fungi, a really important one is apple scab. Um, so this overwinters in the orchard in the plant material that's left from the last season. Uh, and so as soon as those apples start to start to break out, start to emerge, there's some green tissue. Those ascospores are released from that, uh, from that leaf litter, and then they're able to infect green tissue as soon as it's available, especially during wet uh, conditions like we're having, you know, yesterday and today and maybe tomorrow. Um, and so you'll know that apple grow, if you work with apple growers, you know, they are actively trying to manage this disease because it causes these fruit lesions that are really unfavorable um, and unmarketable really when it comes to uh, this disease. So the next one, powdery mildew is caused by a number of different species um, of fungal species, but a lot of diseases are called powdery mildew. Uh, they're related, but you know, powdery mildew the species that causes powdery mildew on grapes is not necessarily gonna cause powdery mildew on pumpkins. They are different species, uh, but they're both referred to as powdery mildew because of the way that their symptoms are. They produce this white powdery growth on the leaves and it can be on the fruit. Um, and so it's very characteristic of kind of diagnosing because you have this white growth. Another common uh, fungal disease is rust. And so it's caused by different fungal species. And, you know, they're actually quite complex fungal species and they are very host specific, but they're all called rust because uh, you have these rusty looking pustules. Um, so if you have an old car, like I used to, uh, you know the color of rust very well. And uh, so it produces these rusty pustules, which uh, later in the season typically turn black um, because that's them getting ready to overwinter. Um, on a different crop or on the same crop or on the residue, but they're called rust because they have that rusty, rusty appearance. Uh, the next common fungal 
disease is smut. Um, and so depending on some of the crops that you might be scouting, it may, might become very common with smut. Uh, the two most common are here in corn and in sweet corn. Um, oh, sorry, sweet corn, uh, corn and onions. Um, and so you get this kind of growth within the plant. Uh, and it's often seed borne that produces these weird, you know, you can see it here in the corn, these weird pustules, and those are just filled with spores um, and obviously not marketable and not desirable. Uh, the last fungal disease I want to talk about is anthracnose. So anthracnose um, is a disease on many different horticultural crops and can be quite damaging. Often it's caused by different species depending on the crop, uh, but there can be some overlap when it comes to something like tomatoes or peppers. But you can see here, often the symptoms for anthracnose is a round circular lesion that kind of looks like a thumbprint. So you can see it really well here in the tomatoes. Um, it's very common in strawberries. It's this round indented lesion uh, that has these kind of once it develops, it has these salmon colored spores that are spread through rain splash um, or irrigation. And so they're kind of sticky spores that need that to travel. Um, and you can see celery here, it's a bit different. It causes this leaf curling, uh, but it's also caused by a Colletoxicum species. Uh, so the next kingdom I want to talk about is the kingdom Chromista. And so the plant pathogens we have that belong to this are Omycetes. And so Omycetes are often confused with fungi. They have somewhat similar structures, uh, but they actually belong to a different kingdom. And so it's really important to know if a disease is caused by an Omycete or a fungi because they are different kingdoms, so often management strategies are different, especially when it comes to crop protection tools. Often one that works on fungi is not gonna work on uh, an OMI seat, and that's because they do belong to different kingdoms. Uh, so the resting structure of OMI seats is called an O-spore, uh, and they can also produce asexual sporangia. So they're not really typically referred to as spores, but they are very similar um, in that they contain these zoospores that need water to swim in. Um, and so because of this, because they need that water to release these zoospores, they're typically referred to as our water molds because they prefer wet environmental conditions and they often require it when it comes to releasing their spores. So a common disease uh, in many Ontario crops caused by an oomycete belonging to the kingdom Chromista is downy mildews. So there are downy mildews, they're different species that produce disease in different crops, uh, but we refer to many of them as downy mildew. Uh, really what you get is, it can be varied depending on the crop, uh, but you get this kind of powdery growth. It can either be white or black when it comes to cucumbers on that, um, on that leaf tissue. And it can, most downy mildews are quite devastating um, when they're not controlled properly. They reproduce very quickly, uh, typically within a week, and they can spread uh, hundreds and thousands more spores and spread very quickly across the crop. And so downy mildew is an important one. Um, and good to know if the crop that you're scouting is susceptible to a downy mildew species. Late blight might be one of the most famous plant uh, diseases. It caused the Irish potato famine. Um, and, you know, so that caused, uh, in, was in potatoes in Ireland. It's still around and in most potato and tomato and uh, solanaceous areas, or, um, crops in different areas today, including Ontario. Um, and it is caused by an omycete, oh phytophthora infestans. And so it can be really devastating if it's not managed properly. We have a lot of good crop protection materials that are, um, have been developed and are effective on this. But this is one that's really important to be able to identify early. So if you're taking any tomato or potato um, specific courses, uh, you will definitely get a better understanding of what this disease look like, looks like um, on these different crops because it is a really uh, devastating disease. Uh, so I did mention protozoan plant pathogens that we often refer to as slime mold. So they're very, um, very simple organisms that lock a cell wall. And so they have resting structures that can disseminate and infect directly um, under wet conditions with these zoospores. So they kind of share a similar structure or dissemination um, structure to those of the oomycetes. 
Um, and so we typically refer to these as slime molds. Um, and, uh, and some of the more common ones we have in Ontario uh, is club root of brassica. So if you're scouting any brassica vegetables or canola, you'll be very aware of this disease. Uh, it's very impactful to our brassica crops. Uh, it causes these, you know, this club rooting. So the roots are not able to properly uptake water or nutrients. Um, and eventually that plant will likely die. And those resting structures survive in that soil for a very long time. So biosecurity, which Denise will talk about later, is really important when it comes to club root uh, on brassicas. Uh, another one within this group is powdery scab on potatoes. Um, so luckily not a very common pathogen, um, but it can be quite devastating again, because those resting structures can survive in the soil for a very long period of time. And like you look at this and you kind of understand why it would be unfavorable to have this disease in potatoes, because you're really not gonna wanna buy one of those. Um, an interesting one in this group is this uh, slime mold here. Uh, actually vectors of virus. So the slime mold itself is not actually infecting the crop and causing, you know, a significant disease, but it does vector a virus that can cause this really severe rooting, this weird, uh, weird coloring within the beet itself and make it unmarketable. And so really what's important here is to understand if that slime mold is in the soil, it is vectoring this virus because that can be really important. Uh, so nematodes. So nematodes, like I mentioned, are within in the can, within the kingdom Animalia, um, and there are hundreds of plant parasitic nematode species. Now there are lots of nematodes in the soil. A lot of them are beneficial. You might have heard of entomopathic nematodes. I think I said that right. It's a bit of a mouthful, but those are nematodes that impact or infect and feed on insects. So those can be really beneficial when it comes to some of those uh, insects that, that uh, live or reproduce or are in the soil. But when it comes to plant parasitic nematode species, there are a number, and that just means that they are infecting the plant and causing disease. Uh, they're small, transparent, worm-like or eel-shaped organisms. They are microscopic, so you're not gonna be able to see it like with the naked eye like you do with a worm. They're very small, um, but that's kind of, that's what they are and they can move within the soil. Some female nematode species lose their uh, eel-like shape at maturity. So our cyst nematodes create cysts and that's the female uh, producing eggs within her um, and then they're released later in the season. All plant parasitic nematodes have a uh, needle-like mouth part, which is called a stylet. And that's what makes it actually be able to feed on the plant. And so that is a common characteristic between all plant parasitic nematodes. And you can see it right here um, on that nematode. So one of them is root lesion nematodes. It has a very wide host range. Um, you can see them here when it's zoomed in. This is a pretty old picture, but you can see them kind of feeding on the roots. They then get into the roots and they move around, they move out. Um, and so they cause these little microscopic lesions on the roots, which can then make them more susceptible to another soil-borne disease. Or if there's enough root lesion nematodes in the soil, they can actually be impactful on those crops directly. Uh, another one that's common in Ontario is root knot nematodes. And so you can see some different examples here. They can be quite impactful to some of our root crops where the marketable part is actually underground uh, because you can see they cause these galls that are really unfavorable. If in really high numbers, again, you can kind of get uh, this disruption of the root system, which doesn't allow that plant to perform properly. Root cyst nematodes. So if you've ever uh, worked in soybeans, so there's a soybean cyst nematode. So there's a number of different cyst nematodes that can feed on some of our crops. Um, an important one is the sugar beet cyst nematode. We're lucky that we haven't detected it in large numbers uh, within the sugar beet area in Ontario, you know, but that's one that we're monitoring for because it can be quite impactful to that crop. Uh, bulb and stem nematode is one, you know, that 
we've actually done a lot of work on here in OMAFRA um, because it was kind of emerging and there was no management strategies to, um, to manage this pest. And especially for garlic, it could cause this like rotting of the clove. And again, it survives in the soil for a very long period of time. And so there are different ways that, you know, we've found that we can manage this nematode, but it is still really important to understand, especially if you're going to be looking at onions or garlic crops. Uh, so the next one is uh, viruses. So there are over 500 types of plant pathogenic viruses. And, you know, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we all have a little bit of a better understanding of viruses and how impactful they can be. They're considered non-living in a biological sense. They're just made up of RNA and DNA, and they can only reproduce inside of its host. And so that was a question. So if you remember that, um, so they need a, a living host in order to reproduce. Um, so some are able to survive on equipment or seed surfaces or in the soil. Typically, it's thought of as being a short period of time, but it really depends on the virus. Um, they're very, very small. And the only way to really confirm there's no signs when it comes to viruses is through a laboratory test. Now, some symptoms are quite characteristic. You have modeling, uh, you have weird rings in some cases, and sometimes those can be enough to kind of give you an understanding of if you have a virus, um, but you really need to confirm them through laboratory tests. Uh, so one that, you know, if you've taken any courses, I think a really important one is um, plum pox virus. And so this uh, was a problem for our stone fruit industry in early uh, 2000s because, uh, you know, it causes these these weird symptoms that make that fruit unmarketable. Um, and so there was a big effort put into eradicating this disease uh, caused by this virus, uh, because you know once you get rid of the host, um, you know, you're able to stop this virus from spreading. But again, it's, it must be a coordinated effort to manage uh, viruses. Uh, one of the oldest uh, the viruses is a tobacco mosaic virus. I believe this was actually the first virus that was truly discovered um, and it's still around today. It can cause uh, this modeling, uh, this difference, um, you know, this, uh, this kind of symptom in lots of different plants. Uh, then there's a couple other viruses that are kind of that are quite important to a lot of industries. So this is potato virus Y. So you can see some of the symptoms here, which are pretty characteristic of viruses. Uh, I just put strawberry viruses here. Uh, in a lot of the perennial cropping system, viruses can build up in those crops. And so, you know, it's really important to try and limit um, the buildup of viruses by starting with clean plant material, uh, because once you get a high viral load, it's really hard to manage um, viruses once they're in a plant. You know, the best thing that can be done is really to remove those plants to stop the spreading from insects um, to other healthy healthy plants. Uh, so one emerging a virus, uh, you know, across the globe for tomatoes is the tomato brown rugose fruit virus. Um, and so if you are going to be working in greenhouses, it's going to be a really important one um, to just be aware of because it can cause really devastating uh, impacts to tomato crops. Uh, so the last causal agent area group I'm going to talk about is parasitic plants. We don't often think of these as causing diseases. You know, we have weeds that are competing and Kristen will talk lots about those. But parasitic plants are actually feeding and taking nutrients from that host plant. And so they are considered to be a causal agent of disease. And so again, they're taking nutrients and they're causing symptoms on those plants. Um, some do produce chlorophyll and only depend on the host for certain nutrients, but some depend on a host for all of their chlorophyll and nutrients. So here's just some examples of some parasitic plants. Uh, so uh, doter, dwarf mistletoe, witch weed. So they're actually feeding on that host plant um, and causing symptoms on that, on that plant. Okay, so we are finished with the presentation. So I'm going to go through the same questions I asked you. Um, so I'm just going to launch those shortly without showing you the answers. <laughs> uh, so if you just bear with me for a second, I'm going to try and get it so I, you can see both the uh, both the presentation and the uh, in the poll results. 
So if you joined recently or you haven't joined Slido yet, so join at slido.com slash, or not slash, slido.com and the event code is intro to IPM. And we will uh, start launching. Okay, so what do diseases need to occur? So this, you, you saw the question at the beginning. So hopefully you were paying attention. Uh, is it the pathogen, favorable environment, susceptible host, or all of the above? So I'll just give everyone a second to pull their phones out or to switch to the Slido page. So you can see the answers here. Most people are saying all of the above. And that is the correct answer. So like I mentioned, there's the disease triangle. Uh, and you need all of those factors in order to get disease, not just one. Okay, awesome. So the next question is a blank is the plant's expression of an infection. So is it a sign, a symptom, a disease, or you're not sure? So you can see the results here. I'll just give people a few seconds. Awesome. Yeah, so most people are saying a symptom and that is correct. That is awesome. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna show that one. Yes, okay. So yeah, a symptom is the plant's expression of an infection. Okay, the next question is, what is a sign of a bacterial disease? So we'll launch that. Is it water soaking, smelly soft rotting, ooze, or what is a sign? So remember the difference between a sign and a symptom. So that's kind of what this question is trying to get at. So we'll give it just a few more seconds. And most people got it right. Yeah, so it's ooze. So ooze is the, an actual byproduct of the bacteria. Um, so it's not just the bacteria. There's a lot of other things in there, but it is a byproduct of the bacteria. And so that's a really good way to tell if you're seeing a disease that's caused by bacteria, if you see some ooze. So the next one is, what is a common symptom of powdery mildew? Is it water soaking on leaves, black growth on the underside of the leaves? white growth on the top of the leaves or angular necrotic lesions. So let's give this one a few seconds. Most of you got it right at the beginning. Yeah, so it's white growth on the top of the leaf. Uh, so very aptly named this disease, uh, powdery mildew. Uh, okay, next question. We have which disease is caused by the water mold group of pathogens? Is it smut, rust, club root, downy mildew, or powdery scab? So the water molds, which need a lot of water typically in order to infect, um, so they prefer really wet conditions because they have those zoospores that need to swim in order to actually infect that plant. So we got most people saying downy mildew. All right. Yeah, most people got that right. Uh, it is a downy mildew. So that is caused by the water mold or the omycete group of pathogens. So the next question is, all plant parasitic nematodes have what in common? So is it females lose their eel-like shape at maturity? They have a stylet. They are economically damaging to all crops or you're not sure. So all plant parasitic nematodes. Right, awesome. So most of you are getting that right. It is that they all have a stylet. Uh, so some females lose their eel-like shape and maturity like our cyst nematodes, but not all of them. And so, yeah, so all plant parasitic nematodes do have a stylet there and you can just zoom in there, you know, with your eyes, just zoom in, no. Uh, but in this picture, you can zoom in and see that stylet. All right, last question, viruses, cannot reproduce outside of a host. Is this true or is this false? So they cannot reproduce outside of a host. So if you take the host away, are they still able to reproduce? Mm. 
Okay, the answer is true. So yeah, most of you got that right. Uh, so yeah, if you take that vir if you take that host away, those viruses cannot reproduce. They need that host in order to reproduce. Uh, okay, a lot. I have one more question. I just want to know how familiar are you now with plant diseases? Do you feel a little bit better? Uh, do you have a lot more to study up uh, when it comes to this summer? You know, were you not paying attention? Were you on TikTok most of the presentation? Um, maybe that's because you're an expert already, but. Yeah, awesome. Okay, I'll just leave that, leave that, uh, leave that poll up uh, and relaunch this presentation here. Or I'll just make it bigger. Uh, okay, so there are some resources uh, available. When it comes to diseases, if you're working in a specific crop, I really like these APS compendium series. So that link there is in your handouts, uh, but it just outlines a lot of the common diseases associated with different crops and kind of how to identify its symptoms, management. Um, and so those I find really helpful. Uh, I guess I should not have that slide there anymore because we've moved to a digital publication. Uh, there are some other books here that I find really useful resources um, if you're scouting horticultural crops um, in Ontario. And so those are in the handouts. But again, if you, if you, if you have any questions, you're always welcome to email me. Um, if you want just this presentation, you know, anything, just email me. Or if you have questions about specific crops during the season, you know, text is good. Um, and then here's just some online resources that Denise mentioned as well. And so you'll have those in your handouts. With that, I will say thank you. Um, there's my contact information, uh, my cell phone, and, you know, that's all online too. I uh, do have a few more minutes. Yeah, I have three minutes. Um, in your handouts, you'll see that you have two posters. And so if you want copies of those posters, if you want anything else um, related to these, like either, you know, they're not great quality or anything, um, just let me know. Uh, so one is called Tips for Scouting Plant Diseases. Uh, and so you have some specific tips when it comes to what to look for in the field. Uh, you know, there's a lot of commonalities between when you're just scouting in general and when you're scouting for plant diseases, but just some important things like making sure that you're looking at the upper leaf, making sure you're looking at the lower leaf. Um, when you're pulling out plants, just being really careful not to kind of pull out the top without pulling the roots out. A trowel can be really helpful um, because a lot of these root diseases will weaken the root system. And so if you just kind of yank them out, uh, a lot of the times those rotten roots will just not come out of the soil and you kind of won't get a good look at how that plant is actually looking. Uh, Denise will go over in detail biosecurity when it comes um, to scouting. But, you know, when it comes to some of our plant diseases, especially soil borne ones that are really devastating, it is really important um, to make sure that you're taking uh, all steps on biosecurity. Um, and then when it comes to collecting samples, there's just some tips here, um, you know, not to take a really diseased plant and just kind of bring it all over the field with you, um, you know, to try and put it into a bag, contain it so you're not spreading it to the healthy parts of the field if you can help it. Um, and then just what to do kind of before you ship it off to a diagnostic lab, um, which there are a number of in Ontario. Um, the other poster you'll have in your handouts is common plant disease symptoms. So this just goes over kind of the terms of common um, things that we refer to like necrosis, chlorosis, water soaking. Um, and then it goes over, you know, some of the common, common things that causal agents are, you know, creating in within plants, when, common symptoms that causal agents are creating within plants when they're infecting. So you have wilts, blights, root rots, discoloration, galls, knots, damping off, cankers. So this is just kind of a quick reference, just so you know, you kind of, if you see something weird in the field, you can have a better idea if that's caused by a disease or maybe some other biotic or abiotic factor. Uh, and so, yeah, happy to send those out if you didn't get them or weren't able to access them. Um, but I just wanted to quickly mention that. And I think, that's about all the time I have, but you know, if there are any questions, I'm happy to do that now. I'll stop sharing and uh, and look for that. Denise, have there been any questions? No, I don't see any in the chat. Um, does anyone have questions for Katie or myself? 
and Katie did cover some tools that you can use like when you are scouting and um, when we do this in person we do go over our scout kit as well so it is handy to have a knife to cut open stems and things like that to to inspect it more closely and the bags and the trowel things like that so um there are a lot of useful things that um, you should be taking in your scout kit when you go out to farms. So no questions? Okay. So we're at 11 o'clock, we're right on time. So that's good. And um, we're scheduled for a 10 minute break. So if you could come back and join us at 1110, okay? Fraser, I'm the engineer. <laughs> for a recording in place, that's great. Um, so I'm going to run my presentation um, and then I'm hoping that afterwards you have some questions. So if you're, I know we're a little quiet today on the question side of things. So um, you can always um, hit, uh, you can always write something down in the chat and we can go over those. Um, so if you're thinking of something as I'm speaking, throw that down. And, um, and if there's something that comes up uh, later on, put it in the chat and we'll try and keep track of that and, and answer those questions for you um, either now or um, if you think of something tomorrow or the next day, just let us know. Okay, so let's, uh, I'll get that going here. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Fraser. I'm the entomologist for horticulture crops with OMAFRA. I normally work out of the Guelph uh, area. I'm housed at the University of Guelph in the Bovey building. Um, and I'm coming to you virtually again um, this year. So this presentation is about half an hour long. It's an intro to entomology for IPM um, scout training. I'm going to turn off my camera just so that uh, it's not a distraction um, while you're listening to the presentation. Um, and it won't, uh, I don't want to cover up any of the content. So um, I'll turn it off now. Thanks. Great. Okay, so again, um, this session is really not meant to replace um, sort of comprehensive entomology. I'm really just touching on some basic concepts. My thought is that I want to um, give you some information that you need for the upcoming crop specific sessions that you'll be attending and I know some of you are attending a lot of them and some of you are attending just a few of them and I do recognize that there's a real um, range of experience in terms of working um, with insects so this is not meant to again not meant to replace any anything like that but um, I, I hope that this will pique your interest and um, help prepare you for the upcoming sessions. So what I'm going to do is I'll talk a little bit about basic features of insects. I'm going to talk about life stages and the whole concept of metamorphosis. There is a handout um, that was provided as part of the intro to IPM on temperature and development. I'm not covering that here but I do have uh, a recorded presentation on that as well. I will be covering the orders of economic importance and then I'm going to take you through a gallery of symptoms and signs of arthropod injury just to give you an idea of some of the, the spectrum of things that you'll find out there. Okay, so the first question I always ask is, you know, why am I why am I monitoring for insects? Well, of course, you want to know who is out there, whether it is a pest species or whether it's a beneficial species. So if you're not out there monitoring, you're not going to know that. Um, one of the great things about monitoring is it can give you some excellent information on what's happening within a population. So is the trend that the numbers are on the increase? Are they on the decrease? And this is really important from uh, the standpoint of the grower because they need to know whether or not a threshold has been 
reached and it's time to treat. One of the other things that you'll find by actually going out in the field and looking is to find out what life stages are present. So there's different life stages of insects, some of which may be um, exposed and vulnerable to uh, pest control measures like an insecticide spray. It's also important too because um, with the new insecticides and miticides that are out there, some of them are specific or work better on certain life stages versus others. So that's really important information. In addition, there may be some hot spots in the field um, where the um, grower um, may just be able to do a treatment of one area and not the whole field. Maybe it's just a border or one side of the field or somewhere near a dusty road where there's lots of mites. So that's important information. It'll also tell you whether there's anything that's kind of unusual. And this is it, this I find is, is a key thing that we really need to stress. Um, more and more and more because there's so many different new pests that are arriving into Ontario and the earlier that we find them uh, the better so you're another set of eyes and um, you can uh, you can help us out in that regard and help the grower out as well and one of the other things too is if the grower has gone in and made a spray you are going to be going back maybe the next week when you can get back in the field to follow up and to see what kind of an impact that spray actually had. So are the, was it effective or not? Is the pest still present? And are the numbers still alarming? And apart from that, I think insects are just kind of super cool um, and uh, hope you take an interest in, in them over the course of the summer. So in terms of looking at insects, um, insects and mites are arthropods. These animals have jointed limbs and mouth parts, segmented paired appendages, and an ex external skeleton that's made of chitin, and this protects them and it gives them structure. Insects have three body regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The head has a pair of antennae, which are highly varied in form, and these give them all sorts of sensory information. It also has a pair of comp compound and or simple eyes. Legs and wings are also present on the thorax, which is actually divided into three subsections, and each of those subsections has a pair of true legs, with some exceptions in immature stages. Adult insects have one, two, or no pairs of wings, and actually the ability to fly makes insect unique among arthropods. Mites themselves are also really important, an important part of the conversation when it comes to pest management. Pests like the two-spotted spider mite, which is shown here, are important globally because they really rob crops of yield, and they're prone to the development of pesticide resistance. But as with insects, not all mites are pests. Many are important predators, some of which are critical biocontrol uh, pests, uh, biocontrol of pests in uh, greenhouse uh, production systems, as well as in the field as well. Mites are also arthropods. They are more closely related to spiders than to insects. They have piercing sucking mouth parts, basically like a straw to suck out the sap and contents of whatever it is they're feeding on. They have simple eyes, they lack antenna, they lack wings, and the adults can have either two or four pairs of wings. Metamorphosis is a term that many of you are probably familiar with. Think of the classic monarch butterfly that transforms itself from a caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly, which looks like a completely different creature. Winged insects go through distinct stages of development before they become an adult, and this is referred to as metamorphosis. They grow through a number of successive instars, each of which is terminated by a molt and ecdysis that replaces the old larval cuticle with a new one, and all of this is controlled by varying levels of hormone. Shedding the old cuticle allows the insect to grow. Think about your shoes when you were growing up. Eventually your toes hit the tips and you needed a new pair to accommodate your growing foot. Well, insects go through these successive periods of molting and growth. They're often new features that show up with, e with each new immature stage, such as colors or patterns or external features like developing wing buds. There are also internal uh, changes that you can't see. The changes that occur and the molts are the result of hormones. Changing the levels of these hormones eventually triggers the insect to molt to the pupil or the adult stage. I really love these two pictures. They're um, examples of insects that are just molting or have just molted. So the soft fly larva on the bottom is still actually growing. So what you're seeing at the top uh, right corner is the cast skin. It looks like a dead dried up insect, but that's actually the cast skin. And then the cicada on the top left is just coming out of its, um, it, it's coming out, it's emerging um, from its uh, nymphal stage. And its wings haven't expanded yet, but eventually they will, and it'll, um, it'll darken up in color and it'll, um, it'll fly away. 
there's several types of metamorphosis that occur in insects and their allies, their relatives. The first is incomplete metamorphosis. It does not apply to sort of more advanced insects, but it does apply to mites and to what we call primitive insects. And basically what happens in um, incomplete metamorphosis is that the immature stages look very, very much like the adult. They just look a little bit smaller. So um, there's, no, there's no wings that have to develop here. It's just that the, the insect gets a little bit larger or the, the animal gets a little bit larger each time um, it sheds to uh, the new stage. Um, mites are a really great example here. Um, mites go through the egg larval uh, stage uh, as well as nymphs and there's multiple nymphs and then adults. The larval stage um, has only three pairs of legs whereas the later um, instars of nymphs and the adults have four pairs of legs and, and there are some species that only have two pairs of legs um, as, as adults um, but that is uh, again what's important here is that there are there's no wings there's no kind of major transformational change that actually Winged insects all undergo either gradual or complete metamorphosis. In both of these cases, there's at least one major transformational change as the insect grows to adulthood. With gradual metamorphosis, each successive molt brings small changes. Many start out as, a, as an egg, although many aphids can actually reproduce asexually and they give birth to live young. Nymphs and adults look similar to one another, except the adults may have wings. Older nymphs have external features like wing buds that you can often see. The major transformational change occurs when the last nymphal instar molts to an adult with wings. Most nymphs and adults live in the same environment and feed on similar things. Here are the uh, different life stages of a stink bug, including eggs, the five nymphal instars, and the adults. Insects that undergo complete metamorphosis un undergo two transformational molds. The first is when the larva becomes the pupa, and the second is when the pupa becomes the adult. Larval stages are referred to as larva, caterpillar, maggot, or grub, and their forms are really variable. Some have well-developed heads, thoracic legs, and prolegs on the abdomen. Others lack prolegs. Some lack legs on the thorax. Some don't even have obvious heads. The feeding habits of larvae and adults may be the same or they may be completely different. Some adults have vestigial mouth parts and they don't feed at all. Common orders you may be familiar with would include beetles, the moths and butterflies, and the flies. I just wanted to mention um, diets briefly. Um, insects can be both uh, specialists or generalists, um, and this applies both to the herbivores or the predators and the parasitoids. Some of them have very, very specific diets, monophagous insects like the parasilla that feeds exclusively on pear. And then you have some that uh, feed more broadly on related genera like the cholera and potato beetle that will feed on um, plants in the um, solanaceous family, so potatoes and eggplant, uh, as well as solanaceous weeds. And then there are the true generalists um, that feed basically on everything. And I always like to think about brown marmorated stink bug, which is an important new invasive uh, species that we have here in Ontario, um, as well as many other uh, parts of North America. And unfortunately, Europe, it's really spread. Um, but this insect will feed on many, many different unrelated hosts. So we kind of refer to it as a cross commodity or a landscape level pest. So the different orders of insects, I mean, certainly um, there's more orders of insects that are indicated here on this list here. Um, the classification is based on um, characteristic body forms. There's several orders of importance to agriculture that I'm gonna go over today. Remember how I said the ability to fly is unique to insects among arthropods? Well, insect orders get their names from a crude description of their wings. Some of the other features you're gonna be looking at might be the shapes of the legs or the antenna, but all of this is really beyond the scope of the intro session. I'm going to cover these orders with the exception of Orthoptera, the grasshoppers and crickets, because I suspect most of you know what these, um, what these look like. Some of the most serious pests globally include members of the Homopteran suborder. For example, virtually all of the crops you will learn about have at least one species of aphid as part of their pest complex. Homopterans are usually small insects, but they are highly varied in form. Sometimes it's even difficult to realize you're looking at an insect. You can see the scales in the picture, picture on the top middle. They look like hard bumps on the plant, but if you flip them over, you'll, you'll see the dead female or maybe even a live fe female scale underneath and all of her babies. Uh, called crawlers underneath. Homopterans have piercing sucking mouth parts, which we refer to as stylets, like a straw. Not all of the adults have wings. Some, like aphids, have winged and wingless morphs. Many are important vectors of plant diseases. These insects have a gradual type of metamorphosis that includes eggs, nymphs, and adults. In some cases, the females give birth to live young, as I mentioned with, um, with aphids. 
The heteroptera are often called the true bugs, and they have all they all have the bug in their name. If you look at them, like stink bugs and plant bugs, or minute pirate bugs, or mullen bugs, that word bugs, so true bugs. If you look at the forward, uh, the forewings of these insects, you're going to see that the top part of the wings are leathery, and the bottom part of the wing is membranous, and then the forewings um, are also membranous. This group of insects can be plant feeders or predators or both. Some will also attack mammals, birds, and other animals. They have piercing sucking mouth parts, a prominent beak in the front part of their head that kind of hangs down like a sword that's slung back under the head and body. These insects also undergo gradual metamorphosis with egg, nymphs, and adult stages. And I just have a picture um, here with uh, two stink bugs. One of them is predatory and one of them is um, plant feeder. If they have a kind of long, narrow, spindly looking uh, mouth part or beak um, proboscis, um, they are likely plant feeders. And if it is robust, they are likely uh, predators. Most Lepidoptera are plant feeders. They include the moths, the butterflies, and the skippers. One of the important features to help uh, tell whether you're looking at a moth or a butterfly or, or um, or a skipper is the shape of the uh, of the antenna, um, whether they're knobbed or thread-like or leathery. The adults have a coiled proboscis, which is used to siphon nectar or other liquid-based foods. Although some don't feed at all, some may just have this vestigial mouth parts. The larvae, though, they all have the chewing mouth parts, and they're really the damaging stage that we find in agricultural crops. I love this picture of uh, this uh, caterpillar here. I think it shows the three different body regions really, really well um, in the, the, for this larval stage. So you can see the head, you can see the thorax with those two legs on it, you can see the abdomen, and then there's what these call these little fleshy abdominal prolegs on the abdomen. Um, it, if you're looking at a Lepidoptera, they will have between two and five prolegs on the abdomen, and all of those prolegs have these little hooks on them that we call um, crochets. And that, these are important features because they can be uh, confused with uh, sawfly larvae, which we'll get to in a few moments. Beetles are a really important group of insects, and many of them have been described. Both adults and immatures have chewing mouth parts. This group contains many pests, but all, there are also um, many beneficial insects in there, like lady beetles. Um, and many of them are also decomposers and scavengers. The adults um, have two pairs of wings. The forewings are hard elytra that protect the membranous hind wings. So the, I've got the little arrows showing those little protective um, elytra that are there. And if the elytra were closed, they would meet in a straight line down the back of the insect. And then the hind wings are membranous. Again, these are very, uh, really varied group. Um, some incredibly beautiful um, insects uh, belong to uh, the, the beetle order. And these undergo this um, complete development of egg, larvae, pupae, and adults. These are some of the larvae of, of the beetles that you'll find out there. Um, and you're, you will find the, uh, the immatures and crops as well as the adults. Their forms, again, they're highly varied, but they all have well-developed head capsules. Some of them have well-developed true legs, so those legs on the thorax. Others don't have them. None of them have leg, um, legs or prolegs on their, um, on their abdomen. So that's, that's an important uh, distinction for them. So hymenoptera are another important group of insects that play different roles in agricultural crops. So when you think about bees, they're beneficial. They're incredibly important uh, in terms of pollination services. Ants are real ecosystem engineers. And wasps are actually important predators and parasitoids. The sawflies, however, are generally pests. Hymenoptera contain, also contains solitary as well as social species. The adults have two pairs of membranous wings and large compound eyes. Females have um, an ovipositor or a stinger. Ants, bees, and wasps have a narrow waist, whereas sawflies are thick-waisted as adults. Most of the time, what you're going to be seeing when you're scouting are the adult forms, with some exceptions, like with the sawfly. Sawfly larvae can look a lot like caterpillars with a well-defined head capsule and true legs. They also have those prolegs. So caterpillars, remember, they can have up to five pairs of prolegs, where sawflies have six to nine. They have six to nine, so considerably more. So count those prolegs, know what it is you're looking for. And one of the other things, too, is their prolegs do not have those little crochets. Those little... And sawfly larvae 
they are often exposed haters, but sometimes they feed in some of these, these groups of them, um, or they may be solitary feeders. Uh, sometimes the, lay, the eggs are laid within the plant material as well. So this female here is laying her eggs inside the needle, and you can see all the little, little the pale dots where the eggs have been laid here. So diptera is another incredibly important um, group. Um, they are diverse and they contain both beneficials and pests. So this is a common theme that you're going to hear through this is that, yes, there's a lot of pests in these groups, but there's an awful lot of beneficials as well. The adults can have variable different mouth parts. They can be sponging or sucking or piercing mouth parts, really vary depending on what it is that they're actually feeding on. The larvae um, have, uh, technically they have chewing mouth parts. They do have um, mandibles, although they're often modified or they may have mouth hooks. So typically when we talk about their feeding, we talk about rasping or maceration. So one of the things with diptera is that they have one pair of wings, plus they have these little haltiers, little tiny, tiny, they look like little tiny wings, and they're important for stability and maneuverability. So if you watch flies uh, moving through uh, a system, like the adults flying, you'll see that they can, they're real acrobats. They can change direction very, very quickly, and that is because of these incredibly uh, maneuverable wing system that they have. And so these insects, too, also have that complete development going through egg, larvae, pupae, and out. So if you look at the larvae, they're often referred to as maggots. They lack true legs. Some have well-developed, so no legs on their thorax. Some have well-developed heads with chewing mouth parts. Others have, again, these reduced mouth parts, including those hooks. Um, most of what you're going to see in the crops that you're working with are kind of the classic maggot, which is like no distinct head and they have mouth hooks. Or if you work in the greenhouse, you might find some that are more uh, gnat-like um, that have a, a head capsule that you can actually see. So the last um, order that I wanted to cover are the thrips. Um, adult thrips are really delicate looking uh, insects with these fringy wings. Most of them are quite small. These insects have rasping style mouth parts and when they feed, the injury looks a bit like silvery streaks on foliage or discolored fruit surfaces. About half of them feed on fungi. Uh, the rest of them are plant feeders, but there are some predators in the mix as well. So the injury can be um, the result of the feeding by the adults and the immatures, but it also can occur when the female lays her eggs in the plant tissues, and when those eggs hatch and they come out, it actually injures the, the, um, the plant material. Um, so these guys have kind of an, an interesting um, form of um, uh, metamorphosis that includes eggs, two larvae, two, pre, two pupae, like a prepupa and a pupa, as well as adults. And this is just a picture to give you some perspective on size because these uh, thrips are within the flower head of a strawberry. So you can see, actually see how small they are. And they are flower thrips. They love flowers. That makes sense, right? So we have talked about uh, symptoms and signs of uh, different pests that are out there, whether you're referring to uh, diseases, and this also can apply to insects as well. So symptoms are changes in the plant growth or appearance. So missing plant parts, clipped shoots, dieback, distortions in, in tissues, spots on leaves, holes and tears in leaves, or chewed leaves, or discolored leaves. And some of the signs, these are the evidence of the actual damaging factor. So that can be the insect or the mite itself, the cast skins, the frass, which is insect excrement, the honeydew, a lot of uh, those homopterans produce a lot of honeydew, which is sticky when they feed, it kind of comes out the other end. <laughs> and a lot of uh, insects, other insects like ants and wasps are attracted to that. Um, it, it also um, promotes the, the growth of something we call sooty mold. And then there's the leaf shelters, the cocoons, webbing, as well as galleries and sawdust and pitch. So what I'm going to is we're going to talk a little bit about the injury that you're going to see some of just a we're both, we'll go through a nice gallery but bear in mind that most of the injury to crops is via feeding whether it's chewing uh, like a chewing biting type injury or a piercing sucking or a rasping injury so i have these little icons that i put here and when we're going through the gallery together um you can see that little symbol just as a reminder to the type of mouth parts that you're actually looking at so this 
picture here is of a peach and it's fairly early in the season and it was injured by an insect with piercing sucking mouth parts. In this case, it was oak bug, which is not something that we commonly find here. Um, but you'll have other insects that can cause this kind of injury like the tarnished plant bug, which is very, very common here. So you can see the little pin pricks um, there and you can see this kind of ooze that's coming out of it. It's very sticky. We refer to this as gamosis. So if you were out scouting for that, this is actually one of the signs that you're looking for um, early in the season uh, for insects with these piercing sucking mouth parts. The, the larger holes are actually uh, the result of uh, other types of injury or their older injury. Old stuff like that. So these are actually, um, this apple is actually injured by a stink bug. So stink bugs um, can be a real problem in orchard crops as well as other systems. This injury occurred late in the season in apple. So these stink bugs have these piercing sucking mouth parts as well, kind of like a straw. And if you look very closely to the center of the holes in this picture, you can see the little pinprick points of entry where the mouth parts were inserted into the fruit. So it takes time for that darkening to kind of occur and that depression to occur. Um, but uh, but you can find it when it's sort of a little bit earlier. Like I could have probably recognized this a few days um, before the point where this photo was taken, um, but uh, it's certainly really obvious by this point. So this is an injury in apples, um, stink bugs in tomatoes. The injury looks more like a halo. And when you cut that open, the, the flesh underneath is kind of a cork color. So this, um, this is kind of a neat thing here too, because you see these funny little, um, bumps on the leaves of these grapes and what that actually is is this is um these little insects are called grape phylloxera phylloxera is an indirect pest of grapes it damages the vines by feeding on the roots the leaves um, but it doesn't actually feed on the fruit but what happens is um when a lot of leaves are injured that really uh, decreases the capacity of the uh, plant to photosynthesize um, and that can affect the uh, grape sort of the grape quality at the end of the season, but it does take an awful lot of injury um, to, to, to do this, just because grapes have a lot of extra foliage. These little phylloxera are kind of aphid-like. Um, they, uh, they are, un so they're feeding within the plant. What happens is they start feeding on new green tissue and this kind of um, little gall forms and they feed within the gall. So if you were to cut open the gall, you would find the female in there with her eggs and eventually those eggs will hatch and the, the new, new little crawlers will move out and the female, uh, she dies in there. Um, if you were walking out into the field one day and you found patches or rows of small plants that had fallen over and then on close inspection, you find that they've been clipped, your culprit may well be cutworms. So cutworms are the larvae of the noctuid moths. They're kind of not very attractive, kind of greasy looking things. Um, and they like to hide during the day. So if you need to kind of confirm what your suspicion is, that this is cutworm injury, you need to um, cut through the, um, you need to cut through, sorry, dig into the soil to find your, your culprit there. So these leaves that are here have a lacy appearance. Um, all the tasty green tissue between the veins has been chewed away. And there's a number of different insects that, that kind of cause this type of injury, which we refer to as skeletonized leaves. In this particular case, this is Japanese beetle that had caused that feeding injury. It's a, it is an invasive pest. It's been here for quite some time, but it feeds on lots of different crops. And actually the larval stage is also um, injurious, but it doesn't feed above ground. It feeds in the soil on the roots of plants, but it is quite a, uh, quite a significant pest. If you were to walk into a field and see small shiny insects jumping off the plant as you approached and you see shot hole damage on those plants, chances are you're looking at flea beetles. There's many different species that are out there. Some of them have kind of a wide range. Some of them have a more of a narrow range, but these insects can cause a, a lot of aesthetic injury to ornamentals and to leafy greens. Most crops suffer yield impacts when they're really, really small, um, but they can grow out of the injury unless the numbers are really high, which they can be in some years. So if you wonder about why they're called uh, flea beetles, it's because they can really, really jump. They've got these amazing um, hind legs that really allows them to propel themselves um, quite far away. And they will definitely jump um, when they see you coming. So what's kind of neat with this uh, picture here is this actually looks to me a lot like a disease. 
Um, these, these are, this is a cucumber leaf with these black flecks on it. It looks a bit like angular leaf spot, but actually it's injury caused by the four line plant bug, which is another insect with piercing sucking mouth parts. The injury can show up really, really quickly um, because the insect um, inserts a lot of um, this kind of toxic saliva into the plant that helps break down the tissues. And it, it actually, this is how the injury manifests itself um, after a little bit of time. Now, what you're looking at there is you see um, an immature four-line plant bug, and it is actually feeding on uh, lab. So these pear leaves have really ugly blisters on them. The undersides have this kind of nasty black spots. So you probably realize it isn't a disease, but what are like where are the insects that are causing this injury? Well, actually, there are they're tiny, tiny little mites. Um, they're pear blister mites. They can only be seen under magnification. These mites look a lot like a carrot. They have two pairs of uh, legs at kind of the fat end, and it does take uh, really heavy infestations to cause a lot of injury. But this particular um, I guess tree had an awful lot of injury to it and probably would have had an impact on yield or fruit um, quality. So these grape leaves have a lot of stippling on them. One of the things you might have noticed while you were walking through the vineyard to actually take a look at this um, leaf and find or these leaves and find out what's going on is that a whole bunch of little insects again jumping ship as you're kind of walking through. If you carefully turn the leaves over, what you might find um, underneath are leaf hoppers. Um, now, typically the adults will fly away, but you may find some of the nymphs um, that are present. These are actually all um, adults. And there's several different species of nymphs, or, sorry, of leaf hoppers that do uh, feed on grapes and cause this, uh, this stippling um, injury. They're a few millimeters in size, so they're quite, quite small. So it's really a numbers game. Um, it took quite a lot of leaf hoppers to actually cause this injury um, on grape. So in contrast, though, um, if you look at the great picture of the grape leaf on the, on the left, it doesn't have that stippling to it. It's starting to curl under at the leaves. And there's some pictures of, uh, of hops as well where the leaves are starting to get this kind of marginal necrosis. And what's happening with this here is that there's an insect called the potato leaf hopper, which doesn't overwinter here. And when it feeds on plants, it doesn't take very many of them to actually uh, cause this level of injury. It's just really, really toxic saliva and it causes this um, kind of major uh, change that occurs in a leaf. So it doesn't, the thresholds are very, very low for this one in contrast when you compare it to those other leaf hopper species. So the injury in these pictures is actually caused by spider mites. They also have those piercing sucking mouth parts, so just like those leaf hoppers. Um, so it looks kind of similar, doesn't it? It looks a lot like leaf hopper injury. Well, what, so you're, you're seeing some discoloration. You might see some webbing. If you looked with magnification, you might see spider mites and their eggs. And I really love the picture that's on the top uh, left here um, because it shows a spider mite next to a grain of salt. And I think it's really a kind of a brilliant uh, contrast here. But these can be very, very serious pests in lots of different agricultural crops. They cause aesthetic injury as well as uh, losses to crop yield. And they are really prone to resistance. They love really hot, uh, dry conditions. These terminal leaves on peaches look absolutely terrible. They're all curled and deformed. If you turn them over, you're, you will find uh, colonies underneath because aphids do feed in colonies. In this case, they're green peach aphids. So these insects also have piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, and they, they're, when you find aphids, you'll often find predators that are feeding on them. They must be very, very tasty. These are some um, aphid midges in the top left-hand corner that are actually actively feeding um, within that colony. But again, you will also find things like um, ants that are tending the aphids and protecting them. And in exchange, what they're doing is they're feeding on the um, the honeydew. And I have a picture of that in just a moment. And one of the things with aphids that helps to identify them um, and compare them to something like, uh, let's say, a leafhopper, um, are these uh, cornicles or tailpipes that you find on the, the back end. So I mentioned um, this honeydew. So there's a great big drop of honeydew that is coming out of the back end of this aphid. And you can see there's an ant in another picture that's quite happy to consume that. Um, now, if that, aphid, if that honeydew is um, present in large amounts, it can really cover the um, kind of the understory of whatever it is that the aphids are feeding on. Um, and then you can get a buildup of this sooty mold as well, which is shown on the apples um, in that picture here. 
These blotches each contain a sawfly larva. The female lays her eggs between the upper and lower leaf surface, and the larvae feeds on the parenchyma in between. The feeding chambers become bigger over time. You can see the larvae in its frass when the blotches are cut open. Eventually, these would pupate and the new adult would emerge from the leaf. There's many different insect orders that actually mine leaves, as some of them, again, are very serious agricultural pests. And then the last um, insect that we're going to look at in our gallery are these thrips. So these are onion thrips, and the discoloration that you can see on those leaves is caused by thrips feeding, and probably from egg laying as well, um, because that does also cause injury on the plant. So the, these insects have that kind of a scraping uh, mouth part. They, so they scrape the surface of the plant, and they kind of suck up the, um, the contents um, from the liquid that is exuded. Um, now, these plants here are way past threshold levels. The, the thresholds for thrips are usually quite low. It's really important to get your ID right for the thrips as well as with many of the other pests, um, because they may look similar to one another superficially, um, but you can have different species, and their response to different pesticides can be really variable. I just wanted to finish off with a few additional slides on scouting for insects and mites. One of the things that I think you really need to do as scouts is to be aware of what the different pests are in the crops that you're working with. So make some kind of a, a map um, of when you would expect to see those pests and what the pests actually are and learn to recognize them. You need to be sampling weekly, um, at least. In some cases, for some uh, pest situations, things can change very quickly. You might need to be out more often. Um, it is important to come up with a plan for um, how you're going to walk through the blocks that you're working in. So uh, you want to make sure that you get a good representation of what's actually out there, whether that's a, a W or a Z. Those are some of the patterns that people talk about, plus borders and hot spots. You need to map your, um, your route weekly. Don't use the same route. The whole, like every single time. And you really do need to be using crop specific sampling protocols related to the number of locations in a field or the number of samples per location, the life stages that are present, the percent leaf damage, whether there's beneficials and other things. You need to write everything down because those zeros are actually really, really important. Don't be afraid to pull plants apart. You might need to do that uh, depending on the crops that you're working in. One of the things that I found was a really good tip is the whole um, using kind of the position of the light to help you with your uh, sampling. I mean, you don't want to be looking straight at the uh, like it's hard to look great at a plant if there's the sun shining in your eyes. But sometimes if you're walking under a plant that has like a canopy, like a, uh, an orchard situation, or in this case, corn, um, you can use the sunlight dappling through the foliage to actually see certain pests. So in this case here, um, this egg mass was showing up on the other side of the plant and the sun was shining through and it was evident. It's a picture by my, um, my colleague, Tracy Bowdy, who works in field crops. And then just a final um, word on toolkits. Um, I have my own preferred tools. Um, there's the kind of the standard kits, that all the different things that you have, but I love to have tweezers and forceps with me and paint brushes are incredibly use useful. I use what are called pooters, which are kind of like an insect aspirator. It's something you use to suck them up into a, a container so you can look at them. I like to have a, a nice saws and multi-tools, trowels and clippers. I like to have pop popsicle sticks actually from removing um, insects from pheromone traps. I like to keep paper clips and body, bobby pins that can help really secure my liners to the traps. Uh, clips, garden twine, duct tape, believe me, it has many uses. Uh, flagging tape and lots of it, different colors, but good colors like bright ones like orange or pink are excellent. Yellow and green, not so much. Tapping trays are useful sweep nets. Containers for insect samples, I like to have bags, both paper and plastic, as well as lots of extra trap liners and lures and posts. Sharpies, I lose a lot of them. I try to put flagging tape on them so I don't lose them, but uh, I still like to have lots of them. And of course, other writing implements, gloves, wipes, and I like to have essential oil with me too, just to remove the sticky goo that I get on my hands. So that's it. That's this uh, presentation, um, basic intro to entomology, and I look forward to meeting up with If you do need to reach me, the best way is usually by email.
Okay. Hey, thanks everybody. <laughs> I hope that uh, recording was okay. It's pretty noisy here on my end. Um, so that is pre recorded for you and it will be available as well. Um, so I, um, I see that there are some questions that are coming up. So that's great. So I will go through them here and just read them out. Um, and then we'll answer them. And uh, again, if there's other things that come up, just let me know. So there's a question from Celeste. There are so many different aphid species. Is there a way to help identify them? What features would we be looking at to ID them if we don't have access to a microscope? That's a good question. Um, so I think part of um, what, uh, I'm just gonna take these earplugs out. One of the things that um, you're gonna find in the crops that you're scouting in um, is that you'll be given some guidance on what pests to expect. So that is a good um, helping point for you. From an identification of aphids, um, some of the features that you're looking at, you can see with a hand lens. So if you have a good hand lens that's with you, um, use that to look at features. Um, sometimes it's the spacing between the antenna or how the, the orientation of them, uh, the, the shape and size of the cornicle, some of the general colors can be really important as well. Um, but sometimes you do need to have a microscope to look at some of the fine features. Um, and I am not an aphid taxonomist either. Um, so um, I do, when I am scouting for something and I realize, okay, there's three different aphid species that are present in this crop that are known, it's probably one of those three. Um, so what are the, some of the features that have been identified for those? So I don't have a guidebook on uh, aphid species and their identification. So it's a combination of um, using the tools that I have, um, some knowledge that I've gained through uh, IPM training or other resources. Um, and if I really, really don't know what it is, and let's say it's not a one of, so it's something that I'm seeing a fair amount of in a field, I would definitely take a sample and uh, package that up and I would send it to um, somebody in Ottawa. There's a pest diagnostic, like a insect identification lab that's there, or there's also um, at the University of Guelph, there is uh, a, a clinic that will also look at, at samples for you too. So that's a long answer for a simple question. And I have some really great resources that I use too from, um, from an insect standpoint. Um, one of the pictures that showed up in the signs and symptoms slides is actually a great little book. It talks about insect tracks um, or different tracks of different animals that many of which are insects. And, and um, just flipping through that, you'll see some really unusual things and very may not be exactly the same species as what you're looking at in the field, but it can give you some really good tips. Um, as well, Steve Marshall at the University of Guelph published several fantastic resources, and there's some pictures of those on the last slide of my presentation that I cut out there. Um, there's one on beetles, there's one on flies, and then there's a general guide, and they're fairly reasonably priced. They're really beautiful pictures, too, so highly recommend those um, as resources, and there's lots of great stuff online as well, too. Okay, all right. If there are no questions, I will, um, I'll end early and I guess we'll, uh, we'll have a little more time for Kristen. Okay, thanks, Hannah. Sure. If there are no other questions and then um, we will run the, the review for Kristen's part of it. Kristen had to step out, unfortunately, right now. So um, Katie's going to launch her um, scanning for weeds review. Yeah, I will just share my screen. So she had set up a review on Slido. Um, and so I'm going to share that. So this is a review of her presentation that is on our On Whore Crops YouTube page. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to check that out, um, you know, I'd highly recommend that you do that after this, after this call. Um, but she just had a few questions here just to kind of go over some of the key points from that. Um, so I'm just gonna launch those through Slido. 
Um, I won't be able to give very good context, but at least I have the right answer. So you'll know if you're kind of on the right track and if you know you don't get them, then maybe that's it's a, it's a good reminder to review. Uh, so the first question is, what do you call the first leaves that emerge from the soil? Is it first true leaves, broad leaves, cotyledons, or blades? So you'll be able to see the responses there, um, but take a, take a guess. Maybe you know, and then we'll uh, show the results or the right answer. We'll just give it a couple more seconds for people to get back on their phone. So got a lot of participation, awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna show the answer. The answer is what most people guess. So it's cotyledons, so that is true. Um, okay, next question is, uh, what is the term for a plant that lives for two years? Is it a summer annual, a winter annual, a biennial or a perennial for two years? Wow, everyone agrees for once, that's amazing. Uh, so the, yes, the answer is a biennium. So that is a plant that lives for two years. The next question is, I found a grass-like weed with a triangular stem. What is it? Is it large crabgrass, quackgrass, a sedge like yellow nut sedge or yellow foxtail? So I think the main hint here is the triangular stem. Oh, we got some divisiveness here. Okay, so I think I'll show the answer and the answer is a sedge, like yellow nut sedge. So they have triangular stems. Uh, okay, the next question is, early emerging weeds compete more strongly with crops and cause greater yield losses than later emerging weeds. What is this important time called? Is it the critical weed-free period, the economic threshold, the pre-harvest interval, or the re-entry interval? Okay, so most people saying critical weed free period. I'll just give it another few seconds. And that would be correct. So it is called the critical weed free period. Okay, the next question is what grass species does not have a ligule? Is it green foxtail, Johnson grass, barnyard grass, or I can't see that, but foxtail barley? Okay, I will be honest, I don't actually know what the answer is. So this will be a education for me. Barnyard grass, yeah, most of you got it right, that's awesome. So that is the grass species that does not have a ligule. The next question is, what are the main identifying characteristics of broadleaf weeds? Is it cotyledons and first true leaves, leaf margins and leaf shapes, whether the leaves are alternate or opposite on the stem or all of the above? Okay, most people choosing all of the above. I feel like that's almost always the right answer. And that is correct, yes. Okay, uh, a couple more questions. What is the name of the new invasive weeds that we should be, weed that we should be aware of? Is it purple pigweed, water hemp, purslane, or prostrate pigweed? Just give it a few more seconds. So yeah, if you aren't aware of this weed, I'm sure Kristen goes over it in her presentation. Okay, so most of you guessing water hemp and I believe that is true. 
So water hemp is the new invasive weed that everyone should be aware of. Okay, and the final question is what weed species can cause blistering? Is it wild parsnip, wild carrot, garlic mustard, or lamb squirters? Hmm. Most people saying wild parsnip, and I believe you would be correct. Yeah, so that's one to just be aware of what that looks like because that could cause some, some injury. It sounds like cause some blistering. Uh, so that's it for her review. I will stop sharing. Um, she will be back to join us, I believe, later on today to give a presentation. Um, but again, if you haven't seen that presentation that we were just um, reviewing, that's on the On Hork Crops YouTube page. So I think I'll leave it there. Denise, I don't know what's next on our agenda. Okay, well, there is one additional question for Hannah. Okay. Did you see it in the chat, Hannah? I'm just seeing it now. Question for Hannah, so I'll read it. Um, uh, when scouting in greenhouses, we place yellow sticky cards in the same spot, um, I says week after week. Should we be moving them to a new spot each time? So um, I know that Sarah, if you're, uh, I'm kind of hoping, Sarah, that um, you're looking at some of the information that uh, Sarah Jendrasik, um, our, our uh, floriculture IPM specialist, posts on her blog. She's got this amazing blog, and she actually has um, some excellent information on using traps, whether it's for monitoring or mass trapping or both um, within the greenhouse. Um, I think the thing is with the yellow sticky cards that you're putting up in a greenhouse, the numbers that you're putting up in there are pretty significant. Um, you, I don't think you need to worry about that from that standpoint. Um, and actually, even when we talk about yellow sticky cards in the field, usually there's a placement that's recommended for them. So um, you might have some pests that are border driven. So you might have your yellow sticky cards up in those locations. You don't need to worry about that. But from the standpoint of going out to the field to actually look at things, um, you don't want to look at, let's say, the same 15 apple trees in an orchard every week to look at pest pressure. You might look at similar locations, like you might have some locations along a border, but there may be different trees. Um, or in the interior, um, you'll go to different ones. Um, but that doesn't have to be switched up. It's sort of, I will talk about this too with traps as well a little bit later today, but you might have some trap locations that are up like pheromone traps or other, those ones don't need to, to be moved around. Um, so uh, I guess the recommendation I will make here is when you are taking crop specific um, training to pay attention to uh, what is being recommended for a specific pest in that specific crop. Um, and if it isn't clear, make sure you get that information from the specialist because where you have a trap can be incredibly important. So I will go over more of that later. All right then, is there any other questions? No? Okay, we're a bit ahead of schedule. Sorry about um, that, that Kristen had to step out, but she will be rejoining us later on. So if you do have any questions on the scouting for weeds, um, she will be back and she can answer those later. So we will break for lunch a little early and um, we will be back at 1240. We'll stay on schedule because we do have a guest speaker coming in. Um, so um, I don't know how early she'll join. So we'll stay on schedule and be back at 1240. Okay, Elizabeth Bach. So Elizabeth Buck is a fresh market vegetable specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension's Regional Cornell Vegetable Program. She assists growers of all sizes, experience levels, and production styles in six county regions in Western New York to solve their production challenges in crops ranging from asparagus to zucchini. Elizabeth's special programmatic focus areas include weed management, soil health, and climate resilience and vine crops production. So I hope that's accurate, Elizabeth. <laughs> it was very thorough, thank you. <laughs> okay. So welcome back from lunch, everyone. Um, I am going to go through some diagnostic photo taking and 
uh, since it is after lunch, I'm going to start right off with a little bit of participation, trying to get those juices flowing again. So there are a list of questions coming up. I'm going to invite you to put your answers in the chat. So why bother with diagnostic photos? Doesn't it just seem silly? How are these things used? So I invite you to go ahead and put your answers in the chat um, as I'm reading the questions off. So why would someone bother with diagnostic photos? When or why wouldn't a regular image suffice? Like is a diagnostic photo actually any different than just like click? And how do these photos get used? So I'll give you a couple seconds to put, put your thoughts in the chat there. Um, make sure that everyone's made it back from lunch and is able to engage again with the workshop. Okay, starting to see some responses coming in. I'll a few more come in and I'll read, read the ones off. So to help identify new or invasive or never before seen species, uh, used for comparison or review with an image better than your eye, uh, accurate early info to let growers know. What are some other reasons, folks? This is the fun part of working for the cooperative extension system in the States. We do a lot of active learning. So uh, I'm not gonna move on until we get some questions. That's, that's part of how we roll down here, south of the border. Um, yeah, to help identify and compare diseases for correct identification, helps others give input on what you found. Publications, very exciting publications from Hannah. All right, yeah, yeah, okay. So here's some good, good answers coming in. Thank you folks. We, uh, to build your own portfolio and go back and review. Yes, the image library. So all of these are good reasons for diagnostic photos. My understanding is that most folks here are going to be doing crop scouting on a regular basis. So by far and large, a lot of you will be using the photos for communication purposes. And oftentimes if you're using it for communication, sometimes just, hey, found this problem in the field, but also for identification, and especially if you're using a photo for correct identification, you really wanna make sure you're getting the best image quality possible. So let's go through a few things that you should know today, a few tips on making sure you're capturing the right image and how to take an improved image. All of these tips are meant for smartphones. And I'll say, I am not by any stretch of the imagination, a amateur or professional photographer, right? These are tips that I've come up with over years of taking diagnostic photos out in the field with just a smartphone. So the first thing you should know is that cameras naturally sense so much more light than our, than our eyes. And that causes them to become washed out to our eyes, right? It's a lot like how plants can sense a lot more light and use a lot more light than we can perceive. The camera is actually more closely representing that light environment that the plant's perceiving. But that doesn't do us any good in terms of figuring out what's going on. So this is the same exact plant, same exact image, showing what it looked like if I just pulled out the phone and you know snapped a picture versus going through some of the correction steps to get the right image. And what you'll see is the one on this side. Are you guys seeing the, the little pointer? Sorry, I should have checked that earlier. If someone could just like tell me yes or no if you see the mouse. Um, we can't see your screen, Elizabeth. You're not sharing. Are you kidding? Oh, geez. I am so sorry, guys. Okay. It's like a major presenter fail. I'm so sorry. No wonder people are like, uh, what are you talking about with these questions? Wow. My apologies. Um, is that better? Yeah, we're good now. Okay. So sorry, guys. Um, epic fail on my part. Uh, so now that we can see the photos <laughs> and the mouse, I'm guessing, um, the one on the left is washed out. That's more what the camera's seeing, what the plant's perceiving, but it doesn't do us very good for diagnostic images. We're losing the definition of these lesion zones. The coloration isn't right on the bottom of this leaf. And really what we're striving for is images that match our perception. Um, one of the huge things with diagnostics is that color is so, so important. And just those little changes in what color something appears to be changes the interpretation. Broccoli is really hard if the color is not right. Um, in the center is the true to color one. You got a nice green dollar bill. It's, it's true to color. Again, this works much better here where everyone knows what color a dollar bill is. Um, 
on the left, we've got one where the image is too blue and on the right one where it's too yellow. The problem with it being too yellow is it obscures yellow bead, which is a very common problem in broccoli when it's exposed to heat. The problem with the one on the left, the one that's too blue, is it obscures any beginning points of rot, which turns out to be a slightly darker, more blue spot in the head. So broccoli is kind of a wonderful way to teach this, but so often diagnostics comes down to slight changes in color. So make sure you're capturing that with your image. And then this is the biggest one. Your ability to make a diagnosis is only as good as the information you have. I'm sure at some point today, you're going to go through a series of questions, right? Someone calls you up with a mystery or you're sent out to a field with a mystery. How do you walk through that process? Well, similar thing with the photos. If I sent a scout out to check out this potato field and came back with just these images, my ability to make a diagnosis would be limited. So let's play, let's, let's play this little game right here. Looking at these images, what do you think might be wrong with this field? Or what's limiting about these images? And I'm gonna invite you to unmute yourself and give a few, a few suggestions. I'm looking for three responses. Ready, go. So either what might be wrong with this field or what do you wish you could see to actually get a better sense of what's going on? I want to see a, a close-up. A close-up. Okay. David wants a close-up. Who wants something else? Or who sees a problem with this? All right. We've got Kayla in the chat saying maybe shade from the trees. Right. So you, would you like to see me walk over there and check that spot out a little bit more? See what's up with those shady trees? I roll with great puns too. Get it? Shady trees. They're so sketchy. Um, one more, one more thing. What, what, what's lacking here? What would you like to see? How is this limiting you? Justin says density of plants isn't consistent. Fields aren't really identifiable. Claire, Claudia is saying maybe too much sun exposure, lack of irrigation. Isabella need better angles. Yes, all of these things. Yes, a little bit of history for the site. This was all one potato field, all planted the same day. Two different varieties. In the middle image, you can see a split on the varieties, but you also see eh, it's not doing so well over there, maybe. And this one variety is definitely not doing well until we get over by the trees, and all of a sudden it does fine by the trees. So what's up here? Well, those images were not the right ones for the diagnostic photo, so we really had to start digging. And digging under healthy plants, like this top image in the corner, is somewhat informative. You know, we've got a nice dark green plant, lots of stems, healthy white roots. This is a good looking plant. This is an important image to have because we've got good and bad sections of the field. When you have that sort of situation, you need to take images of both plants, especially in a case of a mystery. And then I've got the sad plants. This one's not terribly sad, but see the difference in the root development? And when you get up close, you're really seeing that the root structure is very different on these two plants, right? So we're starting to key in. But neither of those really tells us what's wrong yet. Does anyone have an idea of what's going on? We'll just throw this in the chat if anyone has an idea as I keep talking through. Have we yet gotten to the point where if I was texting you these pictures, you could figure out what was going on? Probably not, right? Fertilizer need, there's one suggestion, perhaps fertilizer. I'll point out that potatoes have two different types of roots. They have the actual roots and then they've got the stolons. So here, these big fleshy white ones, those are the stolons, right? Um, versus just a regular root. So we're seeing an absence of stolons on the ones that are struggling. Then you dig up a really sad plant, and this is where we find our answer. We have the shoot that got destroyed. There's just a black tip where the shoot should have been with the axillary bud coming off. We've got, again, another shoot that was disrupted. No stolons really coming off this plant. And then we have the roots and the roots are hooking, they're curling, they're broken off, they're burnt, they're discolored and they're very short. These are the images, all nine of them in order to make a diagnosis on this field. You need this one to see what's actually going on with the roots. You need these two to see that the shoots got burnt off at some point, either burnt or cut. You need this page to see that we're lacking stolon development on the sad ones. You need this page to see the characteristics on the field. Putting all these images together, 
we get the idea that the story of there was physical damage to these plants. Was it mechanical? We talked to the grower. Nope, not mechanical damage. Okay, how hot was it? This is sand, very dry sand. And turns out that the best parts of the fields are the ones that are shaded. And then it's this other variety. So we have a variety that's less heat tolerant that got basically cooked. Without all of these images, we couldn't have that. So if you take nothing else away today, it is more important to have the correct images than to have a super high quality image. You can make up for a so-so quality image, but you cannot make up for having the wrong image. Everyone good with that? I can't see you. So I'm imagining you all saying they're going, uh-huh. All right, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. So now that I've made my point, let's talk about how you get those high quality images. So what is a high quality image? It's one that matches your eye's perception, okay? It's a sharp image, sharp meaning clear, well focused, and the image captures the correct subject. I like using this picture here for teaching this concept. So these are hatching squash bug eggs. They're very small. When you are looking at this in the field, these look like a bunch of teeny little spiders running around, but they're not, they're baby squash bugs. I love how crisp each of these eggs are. It's very true to color. You can see the different, the hollow ones that have hatched. You can see the color change as they begin to hatch. You can see all the little legs on these squash bugs. You can even see an aphid and it thrips. Awesome clarity, crispness, true to color. This is what you wanna aim for, right? Anyone could look at this who works in protein and be like, yeah, I know exactly what's going on. And I can look at those eggs and I can say, how soon you have until they hatch? You can tell they're all first instar. Okay, so here are some tips. One, a lot of people wear shades in the field. Take them off. Just take the sunglasses off. They're filtering out different wavelengths of light. So you put shades on, things look a little more blue or a little more yellow frequently, okay? If you are taking the photo with the shades on, you're not really getting the true color. You don't know what the true color is. So just take them off. Second thing, put shade over the subject. That really helps prevent the image from washing out. So easy way to do this is just turn, sun to your back, kind of hover over the subject. Um, if it's something small, something that's not easily shaded, a lot of folks wear a hat out in the field, just take the hat off, use the brim of your ball cap to shade the subject. Or if the camera itself is in too much light, hold the camera, put the ball cap over the camera, and then lean both over what you're trying to take a picture of. That's the best tip for um, making things come true to color, reducing washout and improving the white balance of the, of the picture. So the second thing, clean off the camera lens. I don't know if you're like me, but I am constantly locking and unlocking the phone with the little finger thing on the back, which means I'm also constantly touching the lens. There's dirt on the lens, all that stuff. Just take a second and wipe it off, especially if you're dealing with a mystery case. You don't want to have to go back out to the field. I hate having to go back out to the field. I hate having to send someone else out to drive 45 minutes to go out to the field because I didn't get the information the first time. Um, clear out the distractions from around what you're trying to take a picture of. Uh, that helps you get just that image focused. Um, filters often aren't worth the trouble. They're, they're changing the crispness. They're changing the, the blurring certain parts. They're changing the contrast. They're changing color. It's, it's not really the right way to go. Um, and then sometimes you have things that just won't focus. The camera can't figure out the depth of field. That's where I like to use portrait mode. And portrait mode really is meant to pop things off the background. It's especially useful when you're dealing with small young plants that are close to the soil. And when you're dealing with things up in the air, like uh, corn tassels or corn leaves, you're out, you're scouting cornfield and you're finding a bunch of broken tassels. And you wanna document that and send it to the grower and say like, yo, broken tassels, get on your corn borer sprays. You got, you got a case for quite a problem in here. Get after that, send them that photo. You're gonna use portrait mode to get that to pop out against the sky. Um, this is just the difference between portrait mode, not really first image focused on the soil, if anything at all. The second one pops the plant right out and now we're seeing the blackening of the veins and that's an instant diagnosis for a bacterial infection in this young brassica. Sometimes things are moving a lot. You know, you're moving, the camera's moving. Anytime you can stabilize it, um, you know, a post in the field, uh, top of this tomato steak, put your elbows against your ribs or, you know, if it's down low to the ground, uh, rest the camera on your boot, anything that's going to stabilize it, the camera, 
removing wind is a factor. Again, that's where you place yourself, placing yourself so the wind is to your back um, or blocking the wind when you can. And insects are notoriously hard to photograph. I like to just capture them, toss them in a Ziploc, huck them in a freezer for 30 minutes, and they'll be either dead or slow. And then you can photograph them to your heart's content. Um, when you're also photographing insects, I don't mind having a finger bit in the image because it gives you scale. And so this Western bean cutworm would be almost impossible to grab, grab an image of in the field. But after 20 minutes on ice, I can do anything with him I want. Um, I've also put him right close down to the uh, dashboard of the car to remove the background to, to make the camera more easily be able to focus. I put him right against a solid backdrop so the camera's not trying to decide what it wants an image of. All right, a lot of times you're trying to capture something small. The instinct is to just zoom in. Um, I've found that in practice, you adjust your distance first, move the camera closer, and then zoom in second. And that gives you a better quality shot. Um, I know these two images both look like crap, but the top one is where I just zoomed in and zoomed in and zoomed in. And all I see is kind of like white pustules. This bottom one though, there's a section right here that's, that's clear and you can see more of the structure of that fungus. And, and that was actually useful to the diagnostician to ID this thing. What I did there was I took a hand lens and just held a hand lens over the camera. When you do that, you kind of have to fiddle with it a little bit, but you can get those really good macro shots. It's particularly useful for small insects, thrips, aphids, um, spider mites, broad mites, well, not broad mites, but spider mites, um, good tricks. And then the final one is adjust the white balance. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. Sometimes adjusting the white balance is as simple as sliding that little light bulb or sunshine icon left, right, just to increase, decrease that on the phone. And you never know how these shots are going to be used. So try and take high resolution shots when you can. These are um, top and bottom of the same exact cutworm. On the bottom, these are the high resolution versions, the ones that just came off the computer. On the top, this is how they looked when they were printed. Especially if you look at this middle photo, you can see how much crisper it is. You can see the dots much more clearly around the edge of this caterpillar, the identifying marks. A lot of that gets lost when an image goes to print, even starting with a high quality image. So if you know this is gonna be reused in some format, you're gonna email this and it gets compressed. You're gonna print this and it gets pixelated, right? Start with the highest quality image you can. That way it's still useful for the end user. That's particularly important for those of us who have um, outreach components as parts of our job. So with that, I wanna say thank you for your concentration. Thanks for playing along with the active learning, a little bit of interaction here after lunch. And again, my apologies for not throwing the slides up at the beginning. Um, if you have any questions, you can throw them in the chat. I don't wanna uh, take more time than is allotted. So thank you very much. Great, thanks, Elizabeth. That talk is always good. We really enjoyed it last year too. It's um, we do have a challenge sometimes where we do get photos and we can't really tell what it is. Um, we recently got one, Hannah and I, about beetles, and we couldn't tell the the details on the legs and things like that to help ID it. So it is really important to take good photos. Lots of good tips. So thank you. And I included Elizabeth's handout um, that she has on this. Um, um, in your package that you got as well. So, yeah, if you have any more questions, put it in the chat and then we'll proceed on with Hannah's talk. Hi, welcome back from lunch, everybody. Uh, this is gonna be a live talk, which is a, a challenge because I have a visitor who, uh, my cat, who's decided to wake up. So he's gonna make an appearance quite likely, unfortunately. It's either that or he's gonna squawk. Um, so yeah, I'll, um, I'll pull up my presentation and um, we'll talk about insect traps. Um, and there's a lot to talk about, but I have a limited amount of time. And I, again, a lot of this material will hopefully be covered in the crop specific sec uh, sections that you take over the next week or so. But these are some things that I think are worth reminding people about. So let me just pull that up. And... We'll start the show. Okay, there we go. It's slow. 
I have a slow computer, so it's, uh, there we go. All right. Um, so if there's any questions that come up, just put them in the chat or feel free to uh, um, ask me after this presentation. So yes, this talk is about making insect traps work. And I think where this talk comes from um, and why I wanted to highlight this today is that um, traps are used in a lot of scouting, right? And if they're not used properly, they're not giving you the information that you need. Um, and in some cases that, in many cases that can be um, really problematic from the standpoint of uh, the grower response, the response they need to make. So let's, let's spend a little bit of time talking about trapping insects in IPM um, programs. Um, and some of this is stuff that we've kind of covered indirectly through my first talk, but the whole idea about uh, pest detection. I mean, has the pest shown up yet? Um, this can be really important for, let's say, pests that maybe don't even overwinter here, um, that we have pheromone traps up for. Um, their arrival may vary from one year to the next, so it's great to have those things there. Um, and it can just be important to know whether a pest is present or absent, period. Um, they can be uh, really, really useful to uh, trigger um, more in-depth um, in-crop field scouting. So if you have some traps up and you know that there's been some pests detected, uh, you may need to go in and do some uh, more intensive monitoring. Um, they can tell you a little bit about pest activity patterns as well. So for example, um, in the past, um, we used to use um, the trapping um, of oriental fruit moth, the patterns of trapping, you know, were they starting to fly? Were they at peak flight? Were they starting to kind of those numbers go down? We used, we used to use that for helping to time the insecticide sprays. And to some extent, we still do, although we also use degree day models. And those uh, have a presentation or a part of, uh, handout that's that should be associated with uh, our training today. I can, they can give you information on uh, the numbers. So Denise talked about ashen thresholds, um, and they can be used to initiate what we call a biofix. So starting degree day models that maybe that first consistent flight of an insect in the springtime can be used to start those degree day models. Um, they can be used in some cases to uh, attract and kill or for mass trapping. I mentioned greenhouses um, and trap somebody. At, uh, I think Celeste had a question earlier on about um, trapping um, in greenhouses and um, placement of traps and things like that. And I mentioned that they can be used for um, just for monitoring, but they can also be used for mass trapping as well. And surveillance. So we have a number of different pests that we are concerned about in Ontario. And in some cases, we have uh, good traps for those that we can put up for them. So when you look at traps, I mean, they often involve um, several uh, different components to them, different elements to them. There can be uh, a physical component to it that maybe takes advantage of an insect behavior, how it moves through the crop. There can be a visual component, so colors, different colors of traps, different colors of sticky cards and different shapes can be very important as well. And then there's that whole aspect of kind of scent. So is there um, a food uh, a bait that can be used to help bring an insect into the trap? Um, and in many cases in agriculture, we use uh, pheromone traps. And I'll be talking about those um, a little bit more towards the end of this presentation. So when I'm talking about physical traps, and remember, these often do combine different things, not just like the physical element of the trapping. Um, but I have some pictures here of, uh, for example, on the left hand side, there's some double sided uh, tape that can be used on trunks or on small branches to intercept pests that are really, really tiny and hard to see and really hard to time when they're actually active. Um, for example, crawler insects, so or crawlers that come out of the scales um, in the springtime. So they're crawling along, they're really, really tiny. The timing can be very important from uh, applying a control measure. Um, and these sticky, uh, these little st sticky strips can actually intercept them as they're crawling around the plant. You can see those. Um, and then in the, um, in the middle picture, I have a clear trap. That's actually a panel trap for um, stink bugs. Um, in this case, the, the stink bugs are not attracted to that uh, trap itself. They're actually brought in by a bait that's attractive to them. Um, there's aggravation pheromones, um, and they end up in the traps, and they're stuck there, and we can, we can monitor for them that way. 
And then I have a trap um, that's actually a, a trap for weevils and strawberries. So there's a little picture of a little black, uh, black vine weevil there. These pests are crawling around um, on the ground and the crop, the females laying eggs and the, they're, uh, you know, can cause some significant injury to the roots of these strawberries. And what these things like to do during the day is they like to hide. And so if you put them into like a little, we put these little boxes out that have a lid on them. The lid is off of that one and they crawl in during the day to hide and you can go in there and count those. And there's similar traps in uh, carrots for carrot weevil as well. And then there's the visual component of these as well. So um, colors and shapes can be really important. Um, there's a picture here of a greenhouse with uh, a couple of different uh, sticky cards, blues. There's actually some different blues and some uh, yellow in there as well. There's a um, a three-dimensional white trap that's used for uh, capturing European apple sawfly. And I've got a pipe trap with that yellow top on it. That's for stink bugs, a yellow, uh, that red sphere, which is good for um, apple maggots. And the females are really attracted to that red. It looks like a ripe fruit or ripening fruit. Um, and so those can all be used for monitoring. I mean, color can be really uh, super important. Um, there, for example, you'll see a lot of yellow sticky cards and yellow is a very attractive color to a lot of different insects, but it isn't always ideally the best uh, color to use. This, this uh, slide that I have here is some work that was done about 15 years ago in Ontario to try to optimize the trap design uh, for a pest called the Swede midge, which is a very, very significant uh, pest of brassicas. This work was done at the University of Guelph by Rebecca Hallett's lab. And what they looked at was not only different types of traps, so different shapes, physical shapes, but also different colors of that. And from that, they were able to find that um, the uh, Jackson trap design um, in a light color like white um, was very, very attractive to this pest. And um, it was the most effective. And that's actually uh, the trap that was recommended paired with a pheromone trap for, man or for uh, monitoring this, this pest. And I mentioned just earlier uh, Sarah's work, um, and again with traps. And so I just I I, I wanted to remind people about her blog because I think it's great. She's got lots of funny stuff in there and really informative too. Um, but she talked about some of the uh, work that was done with different color traps in the greenhouse for uh, catching thrips. So you can see here that um, this yellow uh, was particularly attractive uh, from a thrip standpoint. So sticky cards catch a lot of insects. Like it would be really nice if they only caught the one that you were interested in. But if you put a, a sticky card, a yellow sticky card out in the field, you're gonna find a lot of different things that get caught on it. There's gonna be dirt and there may be leaves and all sorts of stuff and lots of flies. I mean, in this case here, this is a pepper, uh, a pepper uh, weevil trap. Um, and I circled the pepper weevil on the top. There's a little tiny insect. Well, unfortunately these traps caught catch um, other weevils as well. So you need to be able to um, recognize there's going to be lots of things you're going to have to filter through visually. You're going to have to have a general idea of what the pest looks like, and you're going to have to use a hand lens to, or even a microscope in some cases, to confirm what you're looking at. And I know Elizabeth just uh, did a great presentation on taking pictures. Um, and your camera is actually more than just um, valuable for taking pictures. Um, I have found with my um, aging eyes, I can't use a hand lens very effectively anymore, but I love using my camera. And um, it's just like a you know basic camera, um, has a pretty good, um, pretty good a sort of basic phone with a pretty good camera on it. And I've used it in this case to take some pictures of European cherry fruit fly. And the detail that I was looking for there was this, there's a little tiny notch um, on the wing patterns that helps me to distinguish it from a closely related species. And on the right, I've got um, a sticky trap that was used for spotted wing Drosophila. I get a vague idea looking at these um, and they're really tiny insects or two or three millimeters. But if I zoom in on those, I can get confirmation pretty quickly that I'm looking at a spotted uh, wing drosophila male. So I can do that right in the field. Very, very helpful tool. Um, so in addition to those um, visual uh, or physical traps, um, there's often a bait that's uh, associated with trapping as well, whether it's a food type bait or maybe it's a floral lure um, it, or maybe it's um, something like uh, on the right, that's a, a, a homemade trap for ambrosia beetles. They're attracted to ethanol. So stressed trees give off ethanol. The beetles are attracted to that. And so we've incorporated that um, aspect to the trap in here. So that ethanol is in that trap and the beetles go in. 
Um, we, we can use uh, baits to put in the soil for attracting um, wireworms if we're trying to get a sense of uh, wireworms in the soil. I've got a, a reddish colored trap in the top left that we used for spotted wind drosophila, but that was paired with um, uh, apple cider vinegar. Um, so things like that, those baits can be really important. But probably the most significant um, tool that we're using a lot in, in traps are pheromones. So pheromones are species specific. It's almost like a, a perfume um, that the insect puts out that members of the same species will detect. It's often the female that produces one, but not always. And there's different types of pheromones. The most common that we use are sex pheromones. So they're often used in monitoring um, and they're species specific. So that really helps to uh, remove that off target attraction into a trap. And sometimes they can be used for mass trapping or mating disruption, which I'm not talking about during this presentation, but they do have multiple uses. So they're very, very sensitive in very small amounts. In some cases, they can attract insects that are several hundred uh, meters away. It's quite uh, fascinating. Um, but, but they are very, very useful because they're catching a narrow range of species. So it makes it easier to identify and to count them as well. So um, one of the things that you'll be hearing about, especially if you're taking the Apple course as well, you'll hear a lot about biofix and degree day models. So those um, biofix is basically um, a, some kind of a biological event that we use to sort of trigger a degree day a model, uh, for example, sustained moth catch in the springtime. Um, and this is very, uh, very, very helpful, uh, again, for timing uh, some of the newer insecticides that we have, which tend to work better against certain life stages, or maybe the pest is only exposed for a certain period of time. Um, Denise talked about the importance of um, economic and action thresholds, and um, of course we can use, uh, in some cases we can use the numbers in pheromone traps for that, but uh, it, not always. Um, and remember that whole um, importance of recording. So if you're getting zeros in those pheromone traps, it's very important uh, to record that. Um, if you're getting zeros in pheromone traps um, and you expect that you actually should not be getting zeros, um, and this, it, this kind of carries on for weeks at a time, it could just mean that there's something wrong with your traps. That's actually really important information. Um, and one of the other things too, it's very important to use um, the right types of traps. So that often there's choice, but you need to make sure you're using the right kind, especially if you are um, have um, pheromone-based trap counts with action thresholds, like with the Swede midge, I had a picture of that. There's specific numbers depending on the crop that means you need to do something. Um, in storing and handling pheromone lures, we get this, these questions a lot about, you know, how do I handle uh, the pheromones and how do I how do I store these things? So what's really important is these, these pheromones, um, some of the compounds are less stable than others. They should be kept cool when they're not in use. So depending on the lure in the fridge or the freezer, um, if you're not using them right away, if you're going out to the field, it is a good idea not to leave them in your car for days at a time where they can get really, really hot. That can make them totally useless. When you're handling them, you should be using gloves, um, especially if you're handing more than one type of lure because you can get cross contamination and that can mean that the pheromones don't work at all. Um, I like to um, use specific forceps when I'm, when I'm handling those lures. I clean them very carefully between use with ethanol or I have labeled ones um, that are used for a specific pest. Um, yeah, so those are all important things from a storage and handling standpoint. Um, and then field placement is really, really important. Um, you go ahead, I have to put the traps up in the right place. So for example, this picture here, I have uh, at the top left, there's a codling moth trap and that's left up in the top part of the canopy because that's where the moths are actually active. So that's where you're going to catch them. Um, if you put them too down, down too low for that pest, you won't get accurate counts. So what's the height and the orientation? There's going to be a recommended minimum number of traps per unit area that you should try and pay attention to if you can. Distance between traps is important. You don't want to have pheromone traps too close to one another. And usually I say between 30 and 40 meters is a, is a really good distance. The trap should be out before the pest is actually active. You don't want to miss that first flight. And you want to know, you want to have some zeros before you catch anything at all. So a couple of weeks before the expected activity is important. Mark the location really carefully with flagging tape. Um, I use a lot of flagging tape. If I'm working in an orchard, especially, I like to flag the row that the trap is in, and then I flag the base of the tree um, where the trap actually is so that I can see it when the canopy is there. Because these pictures here that I have, 
were placed early in the season, I can see the flagging tape. But as soon as you start to get lots of um, plant growth and leaves, it makes it a lot harder to see those traps. So make sure you know where your trap is, not just for you. Maybe you're sick and your supervisor or somebody else on your team has to go out to that field to check the traps. So they need to be able to find them very quickly. Keep the entrance to the traps clear and um, yeah, make sure the traps are not in an area that is gonna interfere with normal grower practices. So for example, if I have a stink bug trap and it's three feet high, a meter high, that might be too high for um, the equipment that the grower is going through the field with. So you need to keep that in mind as well. And then trap maintenance is, is important. Uh, the data that you get um, is, uh, is going to be used by that grower to make some decisions. Um, so you need to make sure you're recording things accurately. Um, put the trap, like if there's a lure in the trap, you need to make sure that it goes in as directed. In many cases, you can just kind of throw it in the trap. But in some cases, it's better to actually fix it so that it's hanging from um, this, the top part of the trap down into the trap and not sitting on the sticky surface. I always like to mark down uh, what the organization uh, name is or the trap location, the pest that I'm looking for, when I installed it so I know that uh, when I need to replace that lure and I number my traps as well so that I, and I have a map so I know where they actually are. Checking them regularly at least once a week. Um, every week I'm going in, I'm removing the target insects, I'm recording the data, I'm replacing any sticky cards that have too much goo, too many insects, too much uh, dirt, um, anything else that goes in the trap. And again, replacing those pheromone lures as directed. Um, it hurts me when I go out in the field and I see traps that should have been replaced much earlier. Um, the one on the um, on the left hand side there, um, this is a very common type of trap. It's like a diamond. And the whole point of the diamond is that it stays nice and rigid. I think you can probably see my video with my hands here. You want it to look like this. If it starts to look like this through the rain, the entrance is small, the insects can't fly in it, the pheromone's not moving through it properly, it needs to be replaced. Don't leave those traps out that long. And then I think it's pretty obvious that the one on the right hand side just has too much insect goop and needs to, needs to go. Um, just a reminder that sometimes you find weird things in traps, so you do need to be able to identify the pest that you're interested in. If you're finding a lot of something else, there may be a reason for that. We can talk about that if there's any questions. Um, and I have found some uh, odd things over the years. Probably the most bizarre thing was uh, when I was using all these yellow uh, uni traps, plastic bucket traps, was I was finding that um, mice loved them. Um, and I did this work for about three years in a row, and there were more, a higher proportion of infested traps with mice um, in this uh, orchard um, over time. It's a very fascinating thing. Anyway, so that's it. Um, some quick tips for um, using traps. So if there's any questions and time, I would be uh, happy to, uh, to go over these things. All right, thanks, Hannah. Sure. Um, are there any quick questions for Hannah? Okay. Well, you can put them in the chat later if you do. Um, it did help me <laughs> collect some of those trap collections with the mice that were in it. So that was interesting. It was <laughs> and, <a surprise>. flagging. <laughs> and flagging tape is really important because I spent a lot of time trying to find a trap <laughs> because it got overgrown. Okay. So that's a good tip. Okay. So I'm just going to. My computer's a bit slow today. Can you see my presentation okay? Looks good. Okay. Thanks, Katie. All right. So I'm going to be covering pesticide safety information. Um, so the information that scouts need to know before they start scouting in crops. So maybe not the most stimulating topic, but it is pretty important. Um, information for you to know. So to start off, I thought I would get you thinking about pesticide safety. So we'll start off with a question. So before entering these fields, which one do you have to consider potential pesticide exposure? A, corn, B, raspberries, C, pick your own lavender, D, 
D, organic crops. E, corn and raspberry, raspberry so A and B. Or F, all of the above. So the answer is F. Most crops are sprayed with pesticides at some point during the growing season. Even organic crops can be sprayed with organic pesticides. And even though some of them typically may not be as persistent and maybe not as toxic, um, some of them are toxic. So you do have to be aware of that. It's really important to know. Okay. So there are conventional and organic pesticides. And another term that we use for pesticides is pest control products. So you are probably familiar with Roundup herbicide, which contains glyphosate, and it is a conventional pesticide. So some examples of organic pesticides are Dipel, which contains Bt, so Bacillus thuringiensis, and um, Pure Spray Green Spray, which um, is made up mostly of mineral oil. There are also pest control products that contain pheromones and they're used for mating disruption. So as I mentioned, most crops are sprayed with pesticides at some point during the growing season. So when you're going out to scout a field or an orchard, err on the side of caution and consider that the possibility that the crop you're entering may have been sprayed. Um, you do not want to enter a field until you have confirmed whether it has been sprayed, what it's been sprayed with, and when it was sprayed, because you do need to protect yourself. And just to give you a bit of background on pesticide use in Canada. So all products that are applied for pest control must be reviewed and registered by Health Canada's Pest Management Regulatory Agency, so the PMRA. So before a pesticide is registered in Canada, Health Canada scientists must first review many scientific studies to ensure that the pesticide is used um, safely according to the label directions. So these studies that they review can be on the efficacy of the product. It can be residue studies, studies on plant metabolism, soil dissipation, occupational exposure, et cetera. So the product label contains the label directions. And this is based on the data that the PMRA has reviewed. And the product label outlines how the product can be legally used. And it specifies safety protocols to minimize worker exposure during and after applications. So you can be exposed to pesticides if you enter a treated area too soon after an application. And exposure can be oral, dermal, like through your skin, and respiratory, so you could potentially inhale. Um, so over time, pesticide residues and vapors dissipate until they're no longer posing a risk to workers entering the field. So the length of time required for these residues and vapors to dissipate varies with the product that was used the rate that was applied, and the type of work you need to do in the field, and also the environmental conditions. So how do you know if it is safe to go into the field, orchard, vineyard, greenhouse, like whatever crop you're scouting? Does anyone have any ideas? I don't see anything in the chat. So maybe we have a lot of new people that haven't scouted in fields before. So through PMRA's or evaluation of how the pesticide will be used, um, they come up with what's called a restricted entry interval. Um, which is the period of time that agricultural workers or anyone else um, must not do hand labor in treated areas after a pesticide has been applied. So you will find these restricted entry intervals or what we call REIs, we like to we use a lot of acronyms in agriculture. Um, you'll find these on the product label. And the REIs, um, they will give time for the res pesticide residues to break down to safe levels for work to be done. So uh, when I say hand labor, like what exactly does that mean? So hand labor tasks involve substantial worker contact with the treated surface, such as the plants, the plant parts, or the soil. So I've provided a list of examples on hand labor tasks, which includes things like planting, harvesting, thinning, weeding, and scouting. 
because when you're out scouting, you could be touching leaves to flip them over to see if there are any insects or mildews. And you could be brushing up against the crop when you're walking through the field. So it's important as a scout that you're aware of these REIs and you only scout after the REI is passed. So REIs can range from zero hours up to several days and they are specific to the product being applied, like I mentioned before, the crop it's applied to and your post application tasks such as scouting, harvesting, et cetera. You also should be aware that the REIs can change over time. So periodically the PMRA will reevaluate uh, pesticide registration and they can change these REIs. Um, also the grower or sprayer applicator may apply more than one product at a time. So for these tank mixes, you need to be aware of what products and their individual REIs and you should always go with the longest REI. And sometimes you may not find an REI on a product label. So in that case, you should go with the 12 hour restricted entry interval. So as I've been mentioning, you can find these REIs like on the pesticide label. So you, so you can find these Canadian pesticide labels using the PMRA um, pesticide label search app or their online tool. So you can go on and do a search on the internet for PMRA label. And this is what you'll see when you um, do this. So I'm just showing you some screenshots from my phone um, when I'm using the pesticide label search app. So you will, um, so it's the little icon. It looks like a little ant on it. And the middle screenshot is what you what pulls up when you um, open that app. And so I typed in the word copper, so the far right um, screenshot. And it pulls up 414 results. Um, so it's any pesticide that contains copper or has the word copper within the label somewhere. Um, so that's quite a bit to look through, but um, I knew I wanted the copper 53W wettable powder products. So I um, click on that and it will pull up the middle screenshot, which um, shows some product information for that pesticide. And at the top, there's this green section where it says uh, approved label English. And if you press that, it will pull up, pull up the full label and you can look through that to find, find the REI. <clears throat> so you can use that using your phone. For the online tool, um, you can, there's a box for initial criteria and you can search by product name or the active ingredient. Um, so active ingredient is the compound in that product that works on that test. You can also search by registration number, but typically you don't know that off the top of your head. You usually will know the product name or the active ingredient. The problem with this is that you need to be able to spell the product name accurately. And sometimes these names are really hard to remember how they're spelled. So sometimes I'll have to like Google it first to get the correct um, spelling and copy that into the criteria box. So I selected product name and then I typed in Bazagram. And so to actually um, pull up the label, you don't click on the product name <laughs> in, in here, the hyperlink there, you actually click on the registration number and that will pull up the product label for you. And then you can search for the word REI. And Katie um, showed a slide before where um, we used to produce hard copy crop protection guides and we would have tables that included REI information in that. So we are moving now towards an online digital application called the Ontario Crop Protection Hub. And so the link is provided um, on this slide. And it's also in your handouts. Um, so you can, through this, you can look up REIs for various products. And it is accessible through um, any device like your tablet, computer, smartphone, and it's replacing um, our hard copies that we used to do. So it is a beta version, so we're still working out some bugs, but um, if you are using it and you have any issues, like please let us know, so because we really appreciate the feedback. So if you forget, <laughs> I'll go through some of it, um, a little demo, but um, if you do forget and you do wanna use this tool, I uh, just want to make you aware that we do have a 10 minute video on how to find REIs on our on, on crop port crops um, YouTube channel. So you can look at that later if you want. 
So there are a few different ways you can search for REIs on the <clears throat> Ontario Crop Protection Hub. So you can either go through the, the crop management strategies or you can select by the specific product. So I'm going to select fruit crop protection. And I didn't do a live demo because my internet is sometimes slow. So I thought this would just be a little less painful for everyone. So when I selected fruit crop protection, um, there's 21 crop species that you can search. So I selected apple bearing, and then that will pull up the, the next screenshot that is um, refined by growth stage. So I'm going to select type cluster to pink. And that pulls up 71 products and you can scroll through those. Um, I did end up selecting a sale 70 WP insecticide, which was further down. And if you click on the, the view details, um, you will be able to get the REI um, from that. So it's the, dark, the darker blue section. So when you, when you do click view details, you will pull up this. Um, I didn't include all the information that it's pulled up on here. Like I didn't include the rate information and maximum number of applications. I can fit it all on this um, slide very nicely. But um, I did wanna show that when you do that for a sale 70 WP, it does pull up four different REIs depending on the worker activity. So there is a 12 hour REI for just general um, re-entry. Um, and then there's a 48 hour, 48 hour REI for contact and scouting activities. And then if you're going to do any hand thinning, that would be a six day REI. So that's why I was trying to show that it is important you know what um, activity you are doing and there can be differences. Also, if you're working in various crops, REI for the same product can be different depending on the crop. So for example, like for malathion 85E, there's a 48 hour REI for broccoli, but then there's a 24 REI for kale. Okay, so before you enter a crop, you should ask the grower or sprayer applicator what was sprayed and when. You need to know this in order to look up the REI because you don't want to enter the treated crop before the REI has ended and it's safe to do so. So you should let your supervisor know where you will be that day because that is just good practice. And also check with your supervisor on any products with special instructions beyond the REI. Also, if for some reason you haven't been able to get the spray records or application information, um, you should talk to your supervisor about that. And you should figure out some way to communicate with the farmer, the applicator, whoever the main farm contact person is to get the spray information and to ask um, any other questions that you may have. So some farmers will keep their spray records in a particular spot that you can check it out. And some may prefer to communicate using text messages or a certain app. Though I'm not trying to promote any app over another, just wanna make you aware of some that are being used by Ontario growers. So our Ontario tomato growers, they have been using an app called Spray Hub, which allows the grower to enter the spray records and share them immediately with others that they wish to. And this app will inform them of the REIs. Also WhatsApp and Signal are also handy apps that can be used for communicating REIs to workers and scouts and they're cheap and easy to use. But it can happen that when you arrive at the field, the crop has just been sprayed. Um, miscommun miscommunication can occasionally happen. So it's important that you recognize the signs of the spraying. So one potential sign of, sign of spraying is you smell a distinct odor because some products do have that. A sign of spraying can be a sign. Um, the grower can put these signs at entry points to the crop so the workers will see that it's not safe to enter the crop yet. Another sign of spraying are, um, you may see tractor spray row tracks. Um, so they're fresh. Um, um, so that's um, really good to be aware of. Also, you may even hear the sprayer nearby. In this case, you should leave the field and talk to the grower or your supervisor. So that's kind of what it sounds like. <laughs> 
Sometimes you will see residues on the leaves. So in this case, the foliage is still wet from the application. And however, just because you see residues on leaves doesn't necessarily mean it is a pesticide residue. So here's a picture of a whitish res residue on leaves from calcium magnesium precipitates in irrigation water. So when in doubt, leave the field and call the grower to confirm or call your supervisor. So I hope no one encounters pesticide exposure during their scouting, but it's good for you to be informed of what, um, what to look for in case this does happen. So potential symptoms of exposure can be headache, fatigue, irrita irritation of the skin, eyes, nose or throat, loss of appetite, dizziness, nausea or vomiting, diarrhea, decreased muscle coordination and blurred vision. So if you feel this way after being in the field and you think it could be potential pesticide exposure, you should get medical help immediately. Also a good general practice would be to have a shower at the end of the day. And just, this is a slide um, for pesticide poisoning. There is Ontario Pesticide Center that you can call. And I provide the phone numbers for that center on this slide. Also, you can call 911. And again, I hope nothing like this happens while you're out scouting this summer. And that's it for me. So are there any questions? Oh, Allison did quit earlier check reentry time, so good. Okay. Well, they're a little over, so I'll just let Ann go next then. So thanks, everybody. It's all yours, Ann. Oh, give me a second. <laughs> there we go. And... <laughs> Okay. Come on, computer. There we go. So hopefully you are seeing my main slide. And I'm going to kind of assume that you are. Okay, this part's a little bit different than everything else you've done. Um, because you've been focused on insects and diseases and all the other things. But we, we got to remember that for most of our crops, we're growing in soil. And so soil is still the base. And yeah, I'm, I'm a soils person, so I'm a little, little biased that way, but I still think it's really important to, to not ignore the soil and to take the time to take a look at your diagnostics and keep aware of the soil and what's going on with it during your scouting. And the soil can really tell you a story. There's a lot of things it can tell you. Um, from the basic field diagnostics, field observation, we can get an idea of what the soil profile is like, how deep the topsoil is, what kind of soil texture we're working with, because that really plays a, a part. And the reality is most of our Ontario soils are not consistent. You know, the grower may say it's all sandy loam, but odds are there's something else in that field somewhere. And it, what it appears to be on the surface isn't necessarily what it is down below, which plays a part with drainage and infiltration. For example, I was talking to a grower yesterday who was telling me about a field where he's got a drainage problem. Turns out he's got a layer of gravel and then clay underneath, but the topsoil is lovely sandy loam. So there's things going on there. We can also see if there's a structure problem or compaction problem, water's having problems getting away, roots having problems expanding. So those are the things we can see in the field. Then there's the lab samples, things that we need to send away. So that would be fertility to gender is gonna talk about that a little bit later and pH. We could have a salt problem. We actually do see road salt damage in some places or fertilizer salts. And the other one for a lab sample would be nematodes. So when we're talking about in-field diagnostics, a soil probe, a shovel, things like that can show us really important things. But right off the bat, just taking a look across the whole field, look at what the landscape has to tell us. Often there's um, a difference in the topography, there could be a difference in soil color. We can use a soil probe or again a shovel to look at the depth of the A horizon or the top soil. We can use that to show us if there's some textural layers because that will play a part in how water moves. And what about organic matter? Sometimes just basic color in the field 
will show us where there's high and low organic matter. It might be an area that's traditionally been eroded. So we'll often see the knolls are a lighter color than the lower areas where we have higher organic matter. I know this seems obvious for many of you that have done anything with soils, but it plays a part in how those crops respond. And often this can be the underlying stress that then interacts with that insect or disease. And we can do this fairly simply. Um, there's things called augers and they work great, particularly if you're in stony soils or drier soils. Um, a soil probe, as long as you've got one without a foot pedal or a foot pedal that moves up, uh, you can get to quite a depth. In fact, I can get down about three feet. And even a shovel can tell us an awful lot. So we can dig a little and learn a tremendous amount about our soils. And just to clear things up, um, I often see people talking about having to change the texture or, you know, it really changed the texture. The thing is we can't change texture generally on farm fields because texture is the amount of sand, silt and clay. And that's determined either by hand texturing or through a lab test. You can send away to the lab for a particle size analysis. It's about, about $30. And the thing is that doesn't change. The thing that does change though is structure. That's how the soil particles are held together. And that plays a part in the soil density, how well it can hold and move water and whether the roots for that crop can fully expand. So these are all things we can see in field. And if you're interested, um, Normally we do this, this session in, in person and normally this is the part where we get our hands dirty and we actually do some hands-on hand texturing. And if you're interested, just send me a, an email or put something in the chat later and I will send you this chart and you can use it yourself this summer. It's a fairly easy um, skill to learn. It just takes some time to refine it and uh, it gives you a good idea of what's going on. So. Let's take a little bit closer look at soil structure. What's different about these two soils? Right off the bat, what do you see? And here's where you can put it in the chat. And I seem to have lost the chat bar. Where did it go? There we go. What's different about these two soils? Right off the bat, what do you see? And it's obvious, or maybe not that obvious. It might be a little subtle but there could be a couple of things that you can see right off the bat. You guys awake after lunch? Color, texture. Actually, they are the same texture. These are the same soils, just managed a little bit differently. So you're right, we've got a color. We've got less plant material that's obvious in the high tillage, that's right. So there's a structural, yes, aggregates, thank you, David. Exactly, there is a real difference in the aggregation. There's also, come on, there's a difference in color. So if you look at the continuous corn full tillage, to my eye, and maybe it doesn't on your screen, but I know in person, this sample had more of a, almost a reddish hue, a brown color to it. Whereas the crop rotation with hay, low tillage has this wonderful, um, dark color and aggregation, all those those worm molds and things like that, and almost looks like chocolate cake, right? That crummy structure. So we've got much better aggregation. We've got much better structure. So those are some of the structural differences that management can make. Another infield diagnostic that we can work with is compaction, looking for compaction. And if you think about last year, if you're involved in ag at all, 2021 was one of those off again, on again, on again, on again, on again, rain years. So we do have a lot of compaction out there. So don't be surprised if you see it, particularly in field grown vegetables and things like that. It's caused when we have moist soils, high weight equipment and a lot of traffic. And so that's mechanized agriculture. And if you start looking at some of our orchards and vineyards, we're seeing more traffic all the time with equipment. We certainly see it in vegetables. And while we usually associate this with heavy soils, some of the worst compaction I've ever seen is in sandy soils. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Because if we're building a, a patio base and putting um, 
tiles and things like that down, what are we using to, to create that base? It's not clay, it's actually sand and gravel and things like that because they will pack together really, really tightly. We just add a bit of moisture and a bit of vibration and that's the same as what a lot of our harvesting operations are. And the problem with compaction is we end up with denser soils that restrict root systems and make us more subject to stress if we end up short of water or high temperatures, those kinds of things, we've got less pore space and less available water. And the real kicker here is in a lot of cases, tillage has been done and it's hidden it. So you have to look for the patterns. You have to look for the equipment patterns. So what are we looking for? We're looking for standing water after rain. We're looking for early drought stress in a crop in an area that you wouldn't expect it. We're looking for a restricted root system. See that flattened root from the corn? You'll see flattened roots. You'll see things that look like nubs. They almost look, and look like nematode damage in some cases. You can get almost a witch's broom on the roots because they've hit a, an area that they can't expand into, so they go sideways. You'll see dense layers in the soil. If you look at the picture below, that's my hand. And it's actually a shovel full of soil in a tomato field that has been turned sideways and it's peeling off in plates because there's been compaction in that field and it's a lovely sandy loam, believe it or not. Um, tremendously productive soil, but still had problems with compaction. And we had delayed plant growth until we got a nice rain and then it reduced the, the resistance to that root growth and allowed the roots to get through and then that crop kept going. We can see nutrient deficiencies too if we've got compaction. So let's get down to the soil sampling part. There's three basic kinds of soil sampling that we can do. The basic soil fertility and pH, and we're gonna take that to a depth of six inches. Usually on most soil probes, there's a mark to help you know where you're at. And we handle that sample by keeping it at room temperature. We generally wanna take representative samples. So we're usually talking 20, 25 cores at least and not too large an area, usually not more than 20, 25 acres. In a lot of cases, we're gonna, for a diagnostic, we're gonna be taking good and bad areas. Another one would be a soil nitrate. This one's a little different because we're taking it to 12 inches and we're gonna keep it cool or freeze it. It's probably not one that you're gonna commonly use, but the fertility one and the nematode sample are the two that you probably will have to do at some point. And so if we're sampling for nematodes, plant parasitic and others, the sample length in that tube is actually six inches and we need to keep it cool, but not freeze it. And it is absolutely critical to be sampling for nematodes when the moisture is moderate. It can't be dry soils. Um, and we'll get into that in a sec. So my basic kit for when I go out sampling, especially for diagnostics or actually any other time, is I have my probe or I have several probes. I have a few buckets. I have my boxes, bags, and pens because there is nothing worse than boxing up some boxes and realizing you can't remember where they came from and somebody had said they were gonna mark them. A cooler for the ones that I need to store uh, under cool conditions. I usually also have a few other tools, like I have a knife with me, or I have a, um, a screwdriver or something like that, especially if I'm sampling heavy clays, because often in the soil probe, it may get stuck. And when we're sampling for diagnostics, we're usually collecting samples from good areas and bad areas so that we can see if there's a difference. It's funny, I can remember sampling for nematodes with Albert Tenuta many years ago when soybean cyst was just becoming a problem. And we took samples from good areas and poor areas. And I looked at the structure in both. And the funny thing is he found cis nematode in both areas. It was only expressed in the bad area, but we had compaction in the bad area and nothing in the good area. So taking a good hard look at both areas is really a good practice. Now, nematode samples, cyst is a little different, but most of them we are depending on that sample having moisture in it because the nematodes have to be alive to be extracted. So consider when we're taking that sample, I said it's gotta be six inches, but we're actually gonna take the probe a little bit deeper. We're gonna take another uh, inch or two or two to five centimeters if you wanna talk metric. And we're gonna pop that top part off and discard it. And the reason we do that is because if you think about 
that surface of the soil, what's been going on there for the last couple of days even, and the last you know week and a half, what has that surface soil experienced? Now here's a good time to put it in the chat. What's been going on with the surface soil in the last week to 10 days? Thoughts? Just checking that you're still awake. Nope. Okay, well, the thing that's going on in those soils, ah, there we go. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we've got it drying out and then getting wet again. That's one thing. That's one extreme that we're putting those nematodes because they're a living worm. The other thing that's been going on is we've had hard frosts and we've also had at times some fairly nice warm sunny days where we've seen some real temperature um, building in those areas. So we get temperature extremes, extremes and we get moisture extremes. That's why we take that top couple inches off and we take the bottom, the lower six and use that because we need to have those nematodes alive to be able to be extracted. We need to handle that sample gently and cool it. We don't need abrupt changes. We don't want to leave it on the, the dashboard of the, the vehicle. And it needs to get to the lab as soon as possible so they can extract the nematodes. Um, because again, they got to be alive to be extracted. So there's my contact. If anybody wants that hand stamp, uh, hand texturing um, chart, I'd be happy to send it to you. And that's it for me. All right, thanks, Anne. Um, are there any quick questions for Anne? You can put it in the chat. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. We are a bit over time, not too bad though. Um, how about we come, can we come back in five minutes? Great. Hi everyone, uh, sorry I missed you earlier for the review of scouting for weeds. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to give me a shout. Um, you can reach me, um, sell or text there, my number, or drop message me on uh, Twitter at Weed Profesh. So now I'm going to talk about the importance of scouting for weeds after herbicide application. Okay, so there are many factors that can contribute to the presence of weeds in the field after herbicide application and later on in the growing season. But scouting is really the only way to know which weeds are present, their patterns in the field, and can help you understand why they're there. Um, scouting will be helpful in documenting changes in the weed population that occur over time in response to the management practices including the evolution of herbicide resistant weeds or even just weed species shifts in the field, which means because of an overuse of a herbicide, you might not have herbicide resistance, but you have a change in weed spectrum because those weeds are not controlled on the label. And we've seen this um, predominantly lately with some newer products that work really well in um, orchard systems and so the growers use them over time. And then we just have one or two very problematic weeds to control in those fields. So changes in crop and the weed management practices based on scouting can help you to help the growers to maximize crop yield and profitability by reducing weed crop competition. It can reduce weed seed production. It's really, really important to reduce seed return to the soil and maximizes remedial management tax tactics within the same growing season. So it helps them manage to prevent the spread. So you really need to begin scouting soon after the herbicide application between seven and 14 days and at regular intervals until, till, until harvest. You should move across the field in a scouting pattern, whether that's a, a W, a zigzag pattern, but you do need to cover the entire field. So when you first get to the field, you should really just take a field scan of the field to see if you see any sort of hot spots in the field that you want to make sure you go to and just the general overview of, of the field. So what you need to do is observe and record. 
the weed species that are present. It's really important to do that. And there are a lot of weed species. And I don't expect that everyone will be able to identify every single weed off the bat. But really, if you do, know not, do not know what it is, use Elizabeth's methods and take some good pictures to send to your supervisor or if your supervisor doesn't know, you could always send them on to me. Um, but really you should write down if it's a broadleaf or a grass weed or a sedge type weed and what the leaf stage is. So how many true leaves there are. Note if there's any special patterns um, where the weeds are present in the field. Is it just a strip or they're just patches or you find them more in the headlands? what the weed densities are. So I typically like to take a quarter meter squared or visual, you know, one area and kind of count. Is there two? Is there a hundred? Take a look and see if there are live and dead weeds. And that's when you, right after a herbicide application around the seven day mark, that's where you'll probably still be able to see uh, dead weeds in the field, still see their carcasses. So you'll be able to see if it was a post-emergent herbicide application. Um, if it was working on those weeds. And if there's any symptomology on the live weeds that are still there. So symptomology would be, you know, yellowing, chlorosis, things like that. But if weeds are present after an application, you really do need to determine the reason. You know, you need to know what the field history was. What, because that will have a direct impact on the, the weed spectrum present in that field. So you need to know what the types of weed management strategies that were used over time were. Um, what were the number of herbicide groups that the grower was using? What were the typical number of applications? Is this just a crop um, where they would just use one herbicide application? Or is this a crop where they would use multiple, where they would use different strategies like pre-emergent herbicides as well as post-emergent herbicides? Um, do they use mechanical? Um, cultivation methods to control the weeds. And then you also need to know, you know, the presence of the weed species, including the, the density and distribution. The probability of herbicide resistant weeds to evolve has a direct, is directly linked to the diversity of weed management practices that are used. So if they use multiple different tactics to control the weeds or something we call integrated weed management, that there's a less likelihood of herbicide resistant weeds developing. In keeping records on these weed populations in each specific field over time can help you um, note important changes that are occurring within that weed, weed spectrum within that field. Weed biology is really important to understand. Um, you need to know like the time of emergence of the weed species as compared to when the herbicide was applied. So was a herbicide applied before the weeds emerged and was that the right activity for that uh, weed species or with that herbicide? Was it applied after the weed was too big? Was it a post-emergent treatment and was the weed species already too big to be for the herbicide to be effective? And you need to know also like sometimes weed seeds are very deep within the soil. So they will um, be far below the herbicide layer. And so the herbicide will have worn off before emergence. Environment plays a big role in any types of crop protection product applications or pesticide applications. Um, if there's rainfall too soon after application, um, in some cases it can, it, can wash off the herbicide so the plant doesn't have a chance to take it up and start to metabolize it. In other cases where you have soil applied herbicides, you actually need rainfall to activate that herbicide. So if it's been too dry and there hasn't been any herbicide within a certain amount of time, those herbicides will not work. Um, in application problems. So was the equipment that they were using to apply the herbicides properly calibrated? Was there a plug nozzle? Was, um, was there dust or any dust or other things on the plant that would inhibit penetration? 
Was there poor spray co coverage? Did they use a proper herbicide rate to apply? Lots and lots of things can go wrong. And the point of this slide is you really need to understand all of the different management strategies that went on in the field before you go to herbicide resistance right off the bat. So in terms of scouting for weeds, you should make sure, there's also a handout in your package, which has a nice list of everything you need to know in terms of, and keep, on, keep in mind when you're scouting for weeds. You need to scout seven to 14 days after each herbicide application and near harvest. You need to identify and record the weed species present. You need to determine the distribution pattern of the plants in the field. So if you have, for example, a situation where, you know, there's a line of weeds that goes down the field in a consistent pattern, like every 10 rows, then that could possibly be a plugged nozzle. So there was no herbicide applied to those plants. And determine if the plants present survived or previously applied herbicide application or emerged after the herbicide application. So how much time has gone by? Were there, were there good conditions after the herbicide was applied to control the plants and or if, you know, the plants were too big after that herbicide was applied? So you need to observe the individual plant responses, especially if plants survive the herbicide application, because this is something that you would take into consideration if there is a potential for herbicide resistant weeds. Some herbicide resistant weeds, some may be dead, some may be showing um, some tolerance, and some, and some may actually be full grown plants. So, so there could be a range in terms of the variability of resistance within the field. You need to always look at the previous field history to understand what changes may occur and what would be occurring. So in terms of crop, crop rotation practices, what was the previous crop? Um, are, if the grower is rotating crops, are they also re, um, rotating herbicide modes of action? So in a lot of cases in horticulture, we rotate crops, but we tend to continue to use the same herbicide modes of action. So we are putting the same selection pressure on those weed species year after year. And that's, that's a real uh, challenge for herbicide resistance management in horticulture. So here's an example of uh, something when you scan a field, you'd see this patch, patch of uh, grassy weeds and you say, I better go and check that out. And so this herbicide should have controlled these weeds. Say it was a group one herbicide, which is a graminicide. However, it's not controlling it. And you see, you go in the patch, you see this variability in terms of, um, in terms of the herbicide, uh, um, the herbicide toxicity to the plant. So you can see there we have some that are killed, some with some herbicide symptomology and some that are healthy. So this would be showing the beginning of a herbicide resistance within this field and it's definitely a form of metabolic resistance. So in conclusion, when you're scouting fields, determine, determine the reasons for weed survival first. You know, was it environment? Did everything, was everything perfect after application? Um, or, was there, or was there a problem with application? Um, was the herbicide actually applied at the right weed stage? And when, when, when I talk to growers about applying a post-emergent herbicide, which means after the crop is up, as well as after the weeds are up, I tell them to think about a pop can. So the weeds cannot be taller than a pop can or wider than a pop can for you know, that herbicide to be effective. You need to know what the field history was. You need to understand the weed biology, the environment, application patterns. You can see there's a lot of things that can go wrong in terms of um, applying pesticides. And like I showed in the previous slide, symptomology may differ between observations of a low and a high level of herbicide resistance. So you need to take those things into consideration. Confirming herbicide resistance early when just a few weeds are present and removing them by hand can really decrease the spread of herbicide resistant weeds 
thereby reducing the cost required to manage them. This is extremely important. If you just have a few in the field, remove them right away before they go to seed, because we all know that weeds, that weeds vary in the amount of seed production that they make. Lamb's quarter produces on average about 70,000 seeds per plant. So those 70,000 seeds, if they're resistant to group five herbicides, they go back into the soil, the, the farmer, cultivates and spreads them throughout the field and on and on it goes. Whereas if you have any type of amaranthus or pigweed species, you know, you're looking at an average of 300,000 seeds per plant. So you can do the math up to a million seeds per plant. So if you just have a few, a few resistant weeds in that field, they go to seed, you can actually have up to 3 million seeds. And in our scientific guesstimates, in any one acre of soil in the top five centimeters of soil, you have over 100 million weed seeds. And on any given year, about 1 million will emerge. So once they're in your soil and you have a large um, amount of seed return, you'll be, you'll, the grower will be managing those weeds for decades to come. In Ontario currently, um, this is a nice, uh, a nice table for you to keep on hand. These are the 22 weed species that are resistant to herbicides. Um, in all different cropping systems across the province. And the, the biggest trend is that we um, are seeing more and more herbicides with multiple resistance. Water hemp, this is a real challenging one, which I'll talk a little bit more about later and you did see in my previous uh, presentation. But we have been working on uh, herbicide resistant weeds and we have been um, putting together quick tests or genetic tests where um, we can quickly tell the growers if that weed is resistant or not. And so this is, this is the list of um, actual tests that we've developed in the past five years. Some have come from the scientific literature, some have been developed through our resistance surveying project. But you can see there, um, these, are the com these, are the, these are all the tests that are available. And when you're sampling, um, if you wanna do some sampling or you know, your supervisor um, suspects that potentially the, the field has a resistant weed species, it's very easy to collect samples for this. We only need a small amount of leaf tissue from about 10 different plants within the field, randomly selected. And then we put them in a, a small coin envelope and then we put them in a bag of silica gel um, the silica gel actually just helps keep the specimen dry so it doesn't go to mush before it gets to the lab. And if you're interested or need any of these sample collection kits, you contact me directly. I have project funding to get um, all, of the, all of these uh, resistant weed samples tested free of charge. And we've been doing this uh, now for a while and it really helps us to know what's happening in the different cropping systems across the province. And it also helps the growers know immediately, like two, two days, two to, two to 10 days maximum, um, whether or not they have resistant weeds in their field. And then if they do, do find out that they have it, then they can change their management strategies to prevent the spread. Um, there is a, a poster available that actually outlines the different herbicide groups and the different um, counties where these resistant weeds are present. You can contact me for a PDF copy of that. And here's a very good resource um, written by my colleague and Francois, Mike Cobra and uh, Francois Tardif um, and Jocelyn Letarte from the University of Guelph. Um, you can order this one online. Um, you can just Google uh, Weed ID Guide for Ontario Crops. Um, it's a very good um, hand resource for identifying identifying the most popular weeds in Ontario cropping systems. And um, Denise already did mention about the Ontario Crop Protection Hub because like all pesticides, herbicides do have uh, REIs or restricted entry intervals and they do differ for various, some do different for scouting. Um, and in terms of the Ontario Crop Protection Hub, you can find those within the crops and in the herbicide sections, cards, the cards that come up are a little bit different because they have the REIs right on the card. So you don't have to go into the details part of it to find out that information. And I think that's it for me for now. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you.
So are there any questions for Kristen while to gender loads his presentation? You can put it in the chat or unmute yourself. Okay, I'm not seeing anything, but feel free to put it in the chat. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Thanks. I think I'll hand it. <laughs> and I'll hand it over to, to Jendra. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dennis, for having me here today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tejendra Chapagai. I am soil fertility specialist in horticultural crops with Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. So basically, I am dealing with any issues related to soil fertility management in field and horticultural crops, no, actually fruits and vegetable crops. So before my presentation today, I would like to ask some questions via Slido. So, and that is because I would like to get some sense of how many of you are already got familiar with uh, essential plant nutrients and tissue sampling procedures in uh, fruits and vegetable crops. So, and I request Katie to lead that component for me. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, for sure. So. Uh... As Tajendra stated, we're just gonna go through some questions. Um, so Tajendra, maybe you can just read them out um, as people are answering. You won't be able to see the results and we'll kind of go through the same questions at the end. So go ahead. Sure. Thank you. So my first question is, what are the primary nutrients for crop plants? And the options are NPK, that means nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The second is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The third one is calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And the fourth one is both A and B. Okay, we'll just give it a few more seconds, let people kind of rejoin on Slido before we move to the next one. Uh, good number of answers. Okay, I'll stop that one and move to the next one. Sure, thanks Katie. And the second question is, which nutrient is an important part of chlorophyll? That means they, it plays an important role in photosynthesis. First one is nitrogen, the second one is phosphorus, the third one is potassium, and the fourth one is boron. Give it a few more seconds. Okay, next one. Okay, and the third question is, blossom end rot in fruits and vegetable is mainly caused by, the first option is potassium, second is calcium, the third is boron, and the fourth one is zinc. Okay, it looks like most people already got that one. So I'll move to the fourth one. Well, the fourth question here is, what is the most appropriate time for tissue sampling from field grown tomatoes? The first option is planting time. The second option is early bloom stage. The third option is fruiting time. And the fourth option is after harvest. Okay, it looks like most people answered that one. I'll move on to your last one. And the last question is, which plant part is most appropriate as tissue sample from tomato and pepper? Is that a root, leaf, petiole, or fruit? Okay, I will stop sharing, let's share. Thanks Katie for your help. Now I would like to share my screen. OK, 
Can you see my screen, Katie? Yep, looks good. Okay. So once again, good afternoon, everybody. So the title of my presentation today is Symptoms of Nutrient Deficiencies and Tissue Sampling. And in this presentation, I would basically talk about the major symptoms of nutrient deficiencies in fruits and vegetable crops. I would also talk about tissue sampling procedures in fruits and vegetable crops so that we can diagnose the issues and correct them immediately if needed. So before talking about the deficiency symptoms, I would like to take a few minutes to discuss essential plant nutrients in fruits and vegetable crops. And essential plant nutrient here means the nutrients that are required for growth and reproduction in fruits and vegetables. And the essential plant nutrients are broadly categorized into three different groups. They are primary nutrients, secondary nutrients, and micronutrients. Primary nutrients are also called macronutrients. And there are six nutrients that fall into this category. They are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And out of these six nutrients, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are obtained from the air and water. However, the three other macronutrients, they are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium should be obtained from the soil. So we should apply these three nutrients externally through manure or chemical fertilizers. And the reason why we call this primary nutrients is plant needs these nutrients most. So the, these nutrients are required by the plants in the large amount. And the secondary nutrients means plants require these nutrients in the moderate amount. And there are three nutrients that fall into this category. They are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And referring to micronutrients, they are as equally important as primary and secondary nutrients, but they are required by the plant in the small amount. And there are six or seven nutrients that fall into this category. They are boron, zinc, molybdenum, manganese, iron, copper, and chloride. So in this presentation, we are not going to discuss the role or functions of each of those nutrients. Instead, we are gonna talk about like deficiency symptoms. So when these nutrients are deficient in crop plants. And it is important to note that those symptoms can be confusing because many plant nutrient deficiencies share the same or very similar symptoms. Also, they can be similar to symptoms of many plant diseases. For example, we can observe deficiency symptoms in different parts of the plants. And when we observe deficiency symptoms, first in younger leaves or growing plants, that could be because of the deficiency of sulfur, iron, copper, or manganese. But when we observe deficiency symptoms, first in older leaves, that could be because of the deficiency of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, zinc, and molybdenum. And it is important to note that the deficiency symptoms of calcium and boron never appear on older growth. And the second example is retarded growth of the plant. And the, when, when the plant growth is retarded along with leaf chlorosis, that could be because of nitrogen, sulfur, and copper deficiency. But when the plant growth is retarded without leaf chlorosis, that could be related to phosphorus deficiency. And another example is the yellowing of leaves. So when we observe yellowing of older leaves, that could be associated with nitrogen deficiency. But when we observe yellowing of younger leaves, that could be related to sulfur deficiency. So symptoms could be confusing in that sense. So this image also shows that the deficiency symptoms of boron, calcium, sulfur, iron, manganese, and copper are first observed in younger leaves, while the deficiency symptoms of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, molybdenum, and zinc are first observed in older leaves. So now let me talk about the deficiency symptoms of primary nutrients or macronutrients. They are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And when the plant is deficient in nitrogen, we usually observe yellowing of older leaves. We can also observe thinner stem and stunted growth of the plant because nitrogen is primarily responsible for greenness and leafy growth in fruits and vegetables. And it is the important part of chlorophyll and plays crucial role in photosynthesis process, that is nitrogen. 
And when the plant is deficient in phosphorus, we usually observe reddish or purplish lower leaves. We also observe poor flowering and fruiting and premature fruit drop due to phosphorus deficiency. And phosphorus is primarily responsible for better root growth and architecture of fruits and vegetables. And regarding potassium, when the plant is deficient in potassium, usually we, are, we observe yellowing of leaf tips and edges and the plant becomes susceptible to stresses, both biotic as well as abiotic stresses. So we can also observe like, for example, in tomato, we can observe blotchy or uneven ripening in, uh, ripening in tomato. So potassium might affect the fruit development, fruit quality and development in fruit vegetables. And the basic difference between the deficiency symptoms of nitrogen and potassium is that when the plant is deficient in nitrogen, we usually observe yellowing, they starts from the tip of the leaves and they proceeds towards the base in nitrogen deficient plant. But when the plant is deficient in potassium, we can observe scorched or bond symptoms along the edges of the leaves, along the margin of the leaves. That's the difference between nitrogen and potassium deficiency. And when the plant is deficient in secondary nutrients, such as calcium, we usually observe dieback from dieback of younger leaves and buds, which we refer to as tip bud. So we can also observe blossom in rot of fruit vegetables, such as tomato, bell pepper, and jalapeno pepper. We can also observe tip bone in lettuce, bitter pit in apples, and black heart in celery. So because of calcium deficiency. Similarly, when the plant is deficient in magnesium, we usually observe yellow and white patches between green bands of leaves. We also observe poor flowering and fruit quality due to magnesium deficiency. And when they are deficient in sulfur, we usually observe these symptoms in younger leaves because these nutrients, plants do not mobilize sulfur from older to younger leaves. So younger leaves are pale green to yellow, and we can also observe stunted groups of plants due to sulfur deficiency. And the, when the plant is deficient in micronutrients, such as boron, we usually observe hollow stem in brassicas, internal cork of apples, and deformed apples with brown spots, cracked stem in celery, hot rot and gildal of beets, and dieback starting from the terminal bars, especially in tomatoes and pepper. So it's because of boron deficiency. Similarly, when the plant is deficient in zinc, we usually observe development of small leaves that we refer to as little leaf symptoms. We also observe yellowing of younger leaves between the ribs. We can also observe tips start growing, wilting, poor fruiting, and dieback symptoms due to zinc deficiency. And when the plant is deficient in molybdenum, we usually observe leaves turning yellow and pale between bands. We can also observe leaves becoming bluish green in color, and they do not open completely. And the typical symptom associated with molybdenum deficiency in kaoli flower is whiptail, whiptail in kaoli flower, as you can see in this picture. Similarly, when the plant is deficient in manganese, we usually observe brown spots on the leaves, and we, all, we can also observe stunted growth of plants or delayed maturity in plants due to manganese deficiency. And when they are deficient in iron, the intervenal chlorosis is the major symptoms associated with iron deficiency. And that symptoms appear on younger leaves. And we can also observe stunted growth of plant. And if they are deficient in copper, we usually observe pale and wilting without yellowing. That symptoms appear on younger leaves. We can also observe brown spots. We can also observe dieback starting from leaf tips. We can also observe multiple boards and production of gum pockets due to copper deficiency in fruits and vegetables. And usually fruits and vegetables, in fruits and vegetables, the chlorine deficiency symptoms is not common. But if this nutrient is deficient, we can ob observe wilting of leaves, especially at the margins. We can also observe curling, bronzing, chlorosis, and necrosis due to chlorine deficiency. So that's about the deficiency symptoms in fruits and vegetables. Now, I would like to talk about the second component of my presentation, which is tissue sampling procedures in 
fruits and vegetable crops. And tissue sampling is important. Number one, to identify if a specific nutrient is excessive, adequate or deficient during a growing season so that we can diagnose the issue and correct them if needed immediately. Number two, there are no accredited soil tests available for boron, copper, iron, or molybdenum in Ontario. And information from plant tissue sampling and analysis could help manage these nutrients because we do not have accredited soil tests available for these nutrients. But it is important to note that the results from tissue sampling could be unreliable sometimes for evaluating nitrogen and zinc, especially, specifically due to timing of sampling and growth stage of the plants. So tissue sampling could be most useful when we combine tissue sampling with soil sampling, along with visual inspection of the soil and crop condition. And this table summarizes tissue sampling procedures for tree fruits and vines, including sampling time, what to sample and from where to sample. And in tree fruits, the appropriate sampling time starts from late July to early August, while in grape vines, the appropriate sampling time is early to mid September. And we usually collect 100 leaves for each sample in tree fruits and 100 petioles as for each samples in grape vines. And while collecting those 100 leaves and petioles, we should select two leaves or petioles from current year's growth, as you can see in these pictures. And they are usually fourth and fifth leaves or petioles uh, starting from the tea. And we can collect 100 leaves or petioles from 20 to 25 plants. So that means we can collect three or four leaves or petioles from each plant or each tree. And as a precautions, we should keep those samples separate uh, according to cultivar, root stock and blocks of different age. And we shouldn't combine healthy and unhealthy leaves as a sample. And in strawberries, we usually collect fully expanded recently matured leaflet as a sample. And in fruiting can, the appropriate sampling time is late June, while in non-fruiting plants, the appropriate sampling time is early to mid-August. While in blueberries, we usually collect mature mid-shoot leaves of current year's growth from late July to early August. And in raspberries, we usually collect fully expanded leaf from fruiting can in late July. And this table summarizes tissue sampling procedures for field grown vegetable crops, including timing and plant parts to be sampled. And for example, in tomatoes and pepper, the appropriate sampling time is early bloom stage. And we usually collect petiole of young, but most recently mature leaf as a sample. That means the petioles of fourth or fifth leaf from the tree. Similarly, in potatoes, we can collect samples several times during early, mid, or late growing season. In carrots, we usually collect petiole of young but mature leaf during mid growth stage. In onions, we usually collect samples minimum three times in a season, and we usually select tallest leaf as a sample. In broccoli and cauliflower, we usually collect midrib mid -rib of young and mature leaf at the start of head formation. And in cabbage and lettuce, we collect midrib of wrapper leaf at heading stage. And in celery, we collect petiole of newest elongated leaf during mid growth stage. Similarly, in spinach, we collect petiole of young but mature leaf during mid growth stage. And finally, in sugar beets, they are sampled when sugar beets are 12 weeks old, and we usually collect youngest mature leaf as a sample. And regardless of the timing and plant parts to be collected, we should collect samples from at least 50 plants randomly from across the field, because the lab needs at least 250 gram fresh wet samples. And sometimes, we collect samples for problem diagnosis that we refer to as diagnostic tissue sampling. And diagnostic tissue sampling means to diagnose the problem and correct them immediately if needed. And when we collect samples for diagnostic tissue sampling, we should sample separately from normal growth and affected areas to compare healthy and affected areas. And important to note that we do not sample dead plants as a sample, tissue sample. 
And this slide shows some do's and don'ts that we need to consider before, during, and after tissue sampling. So let me talk about some do's first. We should sample enough materials. That means 100 leaves or petiole for tree fruits and vines and about 250 gram face wet samples from about 50 plants for field grown vegetable crops. Second, we should separate the petiole from the leaflet immediately to stop translocation or mobilization of nutrients between these parts. And third, we should put those samples into paper bags, label them and send to the lab as soon as possible. And some don'ts include, we shouldn't collect chlorotic or dead tissue or the tissues damaged by insect pests and diseases as a sample. Second, we shouldn't collect plant tissue contaminated with soil because contamination always provide inaccurate results. And third, we do not ship the samples in plastic bag because if we do that, they will sweat and rot. So take home messages from my presentation today are, symptoms can be confusing. So many plant nutrient deficiencies share the same or very similar symptoms. And they can also be similar, they can be similar to many plant disease. So they can be confusing. A certain way to know if a plant or crop is suffering from a nutrient deficiency is to have a soil test, or we can also conduct tissue sample test for quick correction of deficiencies. Third, Plant tissue analysis is most useful when it is combined with the soil test along with the visual inspection of the crop and soil conditions. And the fourth one, tissue sampling methods differ with crop type. For example, it differs between tree fruits, vines, or annual field crops. That's why attention is required while sampling and handling of the tissue samples. So as I said earlier, so my presentation, the second component of my presentation was basically derived from the third edition of Omafra Soil Fertility Handbook. And this book is, the PDF of this book is full color and which is available for free on Omafra website. But the hard copy is black and white and that is available for $20 plus tax and shipping from Service Ventari. And thank you for listening to my presentation. So. I would be happy to answer if there are any questions. You can also reach out to me using this email. And before ending my presentations, I would like to request all of you to visit AgriSuite and SoilTestManager.ca because these two tools are online decision-making tools for soil fertility management developed by Omafra and our partners. Thank you so much. And Katie, if you could run, rerun the review questions, that would be great. Yep, I can. If you stop sharing, um, I'll be able to share my screen. Right. So I'll just launch them. Um, we've seen them before, so we'll just get into it. Uh, so the first question is up there, and you should be able to see the results as they come in, and then we can show the correct answer. Okay, I'll just show the correct answer. And then to gender, if you want to comment at all. Yes. So there are six nutrients that fall into this category. They are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But since we are, since the plant receive carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen from the air and water, so we only need to apply nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium from external fertilizers or manuals, as we discussed earlier. Okay, I'll put up the second question. Looks like most people got that one. Yes. Nitrogen is an important part of chlorophyll because nitrogen is primarily responsible for greenness and leafy growth in fruits and vegetable crops. So they are an important part of chlorophyll and plays an important role in photosynthesis.
Looks like most people got that one too. Yes, calcium is the correct answer. And we can observe blossom in rods in fruits and vegetables, such as tomatoes, bell pepper, and jalapeno pepper too. So. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> that, that is the early bloom stage, but you can collect samples anytime for problem diagnostic, as we discussed earlier. Yes. Petiole is the most appropriate plant parts that we collect as a tissue sample from tomato and pepper because they are considered as more reliable source of nutrients compared to other parts. That's it from my side. Thank you so much. So if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. All right, is there a quick question for Tajendra? Yeah, please. Don't see any in the chat yet. Okay, no problem. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. Well, thanks to Jendra. That was great. Am I sharing the right one? I don't think I am. Yeah, we see the biosecurity one. Okay. I wasn't seeing the green box around it to show me that <laughs> it was. So you see the in slide presentation then? Yep. Yep, okay. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, we're running a bit behind. I'll try and get us on track. <laughs> but So I'm gonna cover a farm visit biosecurity. So what is that? So it's taking some steps to reduce the risk of introducing and transferring plant pests within and between farm operations. And so there is no such thing as zero risk, but you should still take steps to try and minimize that risk the best you can. So how can pests spread? So there are natural means, so they can travel in the wind. So you can get um, like soybean rust spores traveling in the wind. Um, you can also have insects flying around and they can also travel longer distances in wind currents. So those are two um, natural means. Uh, pests can also spread by human activity, such as through international trade. So we bring in various seed or grains, um, plants and plant parts that plant pests can come in on. Also, some pests are excellent hitchhikers. So the red circles in the bottom picture are highlighting a couple of brown marmorid stink bugs that came in on a shipment of PVC piping um, from an infested state. Another way that pests can move in on is on contaminated stuff, such as vehicles, footwear, hair, equipment, clothing, hands. And as scouts, these are the things that you should really be thinking about. You wanna be able to protect your clients. You don't wanna be a vector for a new pest um, being introduced to their farm. So this was a paper that was done by McNeil um, a few years back. And uh, what they did was they surveyed um, organisms that were present in soil that had been removed from the footwear being carried in baggage of international aircraft passengers that were arriving in New Zealand. And what they found was they recorded high incidence counts and diversity of viable bacteria, fungi, nematodes and seeds, as well as several live arthropods. And also they um, reported that in each gram of soil, there was an estimated 52 to 84% incidence of genre that contains species that was regulated by New Zealand's Na um, National Plant Protection Organization. So that is a, a little bit scary. Um, I don't know how dirty the, this footwear was in people's baggage, but um, anyways, um, we also did a soil biosecurity project back in 2015 to um, just to, determine the risk 
of footwear to obtain soil-borne pathogens, and we looked at nematodes and fungal, um, when walking around two um, fields of two different soil types. So we looked at um, siltalome and loamy sand, and we also looked at this under dry and wet soil conditions. So we had four people walking around the field with clean rubber boots for 20 minutes. Um, so we went to the field when there was dry soil conditions and, also, and then we went again when there was um, wet soil conditions. <clears throat> and so what we did, we collected soil from each pair of boots using a hoof pick. And um, we also took a background sample using a soil probe just to see um, what there was um, to an eight, eight inch um, soil depth. And then we sent the background and boot samples away for analysis. So we had DNA multi-scan run to look for fungal pathogens. And we also had nematode extractions done. And that was done at the University of Guelph, the Pest Diagnostic Clinic. And we found a bunch of different <laughs> pathogens. <laughs> so the summary of that project was um, the risk of transferring soil-borne pathogens on footwear was similar when walking around siltalome and loamy sand loamy sand fields. And we picked up more soil and soil, born, soil oh, I can't speak, soil borne pathogens. Um, more of that was detected on footwear after walking around fields under wet conditions, which is maybe not too surprising um, because it's wet and can cling to your footwear a bit more. Um, sugar beet cyst nematode cysts were detected on one person's footwear after walking around the silt loam fields under wet conditions. So for that field, we did know that um, it had a history of sugar beet cyst nematodes. So that's why we purposely chose that just to see if we could pick up any um, cysts. So we did under wet conditions. Also, root lesion nematodes were not detected on any footwear after walking around a loamy sand field, regardless of the soil conditions which um, so when Anne covered in her soil sampling talk that um, it's a good practice to scrape off the top layer there. So that's probably why could, um, the root lesion nematodes aren't um, viable there. And Plasmodia fora brassica, the causal agent of club root in brassica crops was only detected in the silt loam soil, but we chose again, chose that field because we knew there was a history of that pathogen being there. And um, the DNA of the Plasmodia fora brassica was detected on most footwear after walking around the field during both dry and wet conditions. And it, if you um, looking at the picture there, we're not getting a lot of soil on the boots under the dry conditions. It's pretty small. So um, it was hard to get enough for the sample to be analyzed. But just because we did find the DNA um, on our footwear doesn't necessarily mean it was viable and that we could in actually infect something else like another host. Um, we would have to have done a follow-up study to determine that, but um, we just wanna demonstrate, um, like we wanted to show the potential risk of picking up plant pathogens and nematodes on your footwear when you are going out to farms. So that was the whole point of the project. And um, just wanted to highlight a pet plant pest that has spread in our province. So soybean cyst nematode, um, which can move in soil. Um, so soybean cyst nematode can infect soybean plants and it can cause stunting of soybean plants, um, causing the leaves to turn yellow. Um, if it's present in the field, you will frequently find circular patterns in the field. So this nematode was first detected in Ontario in 1988. Um, it's now found in most counties west of Toronto and is now in several parts of Eastern Ontario. So it can be managed effectively, but the first step is identification and awareness. And there has been reported losses of uh, ranging from anywhere to 5% up to 100%. So you should have received this handout in the email that I sent you. So it's a nice little checklist that you can carry with you. And I'll just go over the sections now. Um, so that checklist, it was adapted from uh, our Home Afro Farm Visit Biosecurity Protocol that we have for visiting orchards, vineyards, crop fields, and greenhouses. And so it's practices that you can follow to help minimize um, the risk of um, spreading any plant pathogens. There may be additional biosecurity measures required for certain situations. And if you do have any concerns about um, wearing any of the um, 
like the equipment, like a disposable coveralls, let's say might be required for certain situations. Um, you might, if it's in a hot environment, like a greenhouse or a very hot day, you may, there may be a um, safety concern, like for your health, you don't want to overheat. So if you have any of those concerns, um, talk to your advisor about that. Uh, here's just um, a, a, a list of equipment or things that you can carry in your biosecurity kit when you're um, going out to farms. So you can have washable rubber boots or disposable boots. I will carry both. Um, plastic pails and boot brushes to clean your footwear, disinfectant and detergent um, to clean your boots, uh, launderable or disposable coveralls. Not all of you may require that, but it might be good to carry. Um, disinfectant hand lotion or disposable gloves or both. I tend to carry both. Um, garbage bags, it's really handy for putting um, dirty things in like uh, your gloves and whatever. Um, so it, um, you can keep it separate from your clean tools and stuff. And paper towels so you uh, can wipe down things like your soil probe or your trowel, whatever you're using. So this is a picture of my biosecurity kit. So these are the things I tend to carry. Um, I like the little hospital booties for if I'm changing a bunch of traps on one farm because I can slip them on and get out and check the trap and then I can remove them just as I'm getting in the car. So that cuts down on the soil that I'm getting inside my car when I'm getting in and out frequently. Um, lots of disposable gloves I use, um, Clorox wipes or some type of disinfectant wipe. Um, detergent, um, carry Vircon or bleach or both, and also um, rubbing alcohol. Um, if it's ethanol based, I use a lot of that as well for disinfecting. A hoof pick I like to use to get the soil out of the grooves of my rubber boots. And yeah, and jugs of clean water for helping to clean things. So before you go out to the farm, um, where possible, call ahead to the grower just to confirm there's no additional biosecurity measures in place on the farm or any other concerns about particular hazards prior to going out to the operation. Um, example for like if there's a regulated pest or contagious plant disease and follow any additional protocol measures um, of the operation if it's applicable. The grower should provide any additional supplies or equipment required for following the local protocol. Um, I did mention COVID here just in case there currently aren't restrictions in that, but COVID is still present. So um, some operations may still uh, have some things in place um, that you may want to follow. So just to keep that in mind as well, that's still present. And um, schedule field visits to avoid walking in wet fields or handling wet plants if possible. And clean and disinfect any equipment to be used on your plants um, prior to doing prior to using them. Also wear clean clothes and footwear. Upon arrival, um, drive slowly to avoid unnecessary contamination of the vehicle. And also it's just a good idea because there can be a lot of activity on the farm. So um, just helps to avoid accidents. Roll up your windows so you don't have a lot of dust or insects flying in. Like last year, I, whenever I opened the door, my back patch, um, I would get gypsy moth flying in when they were um, when they were flying around. There was quite quite a few of them at some places. Park in designated visitor parking or away from barns or other sources of contamination. Um, don't park near air intake vents or vent ventilation or an exhaust. Um, not all areas will have designated visiting parking, but um, it is quite common at um, greenhouses and nurseries and some other farms do have this as well. And clean hands with disinfectant hand gel. And if they do have a visitor logbook, um, make sure that you sign that and put on your protective footwear and clothing before entering the crop in high risk situations. And situations that are high risk um, when it, there's contagious plant disease or regulated pest um, that's present. And yeah. And so during the visit, if possible, leave vehicle in the designated area and walk to the crops. Um, you want to limit the driving um, through the fields as much as possible. But however, it's not always possible. <laughs> but um, do it when you can. 
um, obey all signage and barriers and do not enter buildings unless accompanied or permitted by the farm operator. Um, I think that's good. What else? Oh, avoid unnecessary direct contact with the crop. Um, certain diseases such as tobacco mosaic virus that Katie mentioned earlier can easily spread by contact to other susceptible hosts. Um, yeah, so I was out um, years ago, I was out to um, a field, well, to a greenhouse and um, was looking at it and it looked fine. And then I went back to that same farm later when it was out in the field and the tobacco mosaic virus virus was throughout the field. So you suspect that probably came from the greenhouse, but unfortunately like when the, the plant was really young, you don't see the symptoms like that leaf modeling. So that's why it's always a, a good idea to avoid any unnecessary direct contact with the crop because you don't always know <laughs> if it's infected with something. And wash and disinfect any equipment that will be used on plants before um, between use on biologically separate and unique areas and or buildings within the premises. So just like in the case of that um, field with club root, if um, there were other fields at that farm that didn't have it, that would be considered like a biologically separate area that you would probably want to work in the clean fields first and go to the club root uh, field with club root last. And before leaving the operation, um, visually inspect your clothing, your hair, your equipment to ensure that there's no insects or plant material or soil that are present or attached. Um, ensure footwear is free of excess soil and plant debris. Um, you can use a brush to remove soil from the tread and wash and disinfect footwear. And wash and disinfect any equipment used during the visit and wash your hands and clean hand, or clean your hands with disinfectant hand gel. It's always good practice. So I've kind of covered this already, but um, just wanted to drive home the message, like when you're cleaning and disinfecting your footwear, the first step is to remove the organic matter because that will bind to disinfectant and making it um, ineffective. So that's really important to do. And also some disinfectants require a certain exposure time. So like Burkhan, you need at least 10 minutes exposure. So it's really important to remember that. Um, yeah. And before leaving the operation, um, if you've used any disposable material, it's best to leave it um, with the grower, like at that farm. Um, and um, quite often, the grower may not be present at the time. So another good option is to put place it in a, a sealed plastic bag or a washable sealable container in the vehicle for later um, disposal. disposal. And try to keep your clean and dirty material separate. Inspect the interior and exterior of the vehicle for any visible contamination. So example, like manure, insects, plant material, and excess soil, and remove as much as you can um, before leaving the operation. And contaminated vehicles um, should be washed before entering another agricultural operation. So some additional measures where you know there's a contagious disease or suspect um, new plant, plant pest is present, um, place any sample um, in a container and seal it um, so that the plant material or soil cannot inadvertently escape from the container. Um, visit the sites with the known or suspected contagious or regula regulated plant pest last. And boots and field equipment must be cleaned with a disinfectant agent before leaving the site. Um, the greenhouse um, vegetable growers, they produce this um, with the help of MAFRA and AF AFC, I believe, um, to um, come up with this checklist that growers can show their visitors. And just quickly, we have time. I don't know what time it is. Oh. Um, just avian influenza is, um, there have been some confirmed cases in Ontario. It was brought in by migratory birds um, and birds can show symptoms such as in disorientation, head bobbing, swimming in circles and inability to fly. Um, this is the number that you can call if you found a sick or a dead wild bird and don't handle them and and kind of just following the same biosecurity tips like cleaning and disinfecting um, when you're at a farm because uh, 
to help prevent domestic birds from encountering wild bird feces that you may be carrying on if you stepped in anything, <laughs> stuff like that. And I mentioned regulated pests a few times. So just so you're aware, the federal government has an agency called the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the CFIA, um, who has a plant protection program in place to help prevent the introduction and spread um, within Canada of plant pests of quarantine significance. So they have a list of regulated pests that they'll take action on. And the actions that they will take really depends on the pest, but it could mean that the crop needs to be destroyed if a regulated pest is found. So I just want you to be aware that there is a responsibility to report a new pest um, to the CFIA. Um, but first you should check with your supervisor that it is a new pest because these situations can be really contentious and should be handled by your supervisor. And immediately, immediately inform your supervisor if you do suspect a new pest. And just to show an example, um, Asian longhorn beetle, which is the, the bigger picture um, in the middle there near the dime. Um, this is a regulated pest by the CFIA, but we do have some, uh, some native species here that um, look similar or easily confused with Asian longhorn beetle. And one is the white spotted Sawyer beetle down in the bottom left corner. And some people do confuse it with Western conifer seed bug that you probably have seen your house walking really I'm walking around really slow. And that's it for me. So is there any questions that I can take while Anne is loading her slides? Sorry, we are over <laughs> the time already, but hopefully you can stick around. We just have a few short little um, presentations we want to cover up some. Apparently. Apparently I can't share my screen. Try again, Ann. Oh, there we go. Okay, I did stop. No, it's happy. I think. I think, I think, I think. Okay. Slideshow. Slow computer. Oh, for Pete's sakes, come on. Okay, so <laughs> in light of what Denise was just talking about, one of the things we wanted to share was some of the newer invasives. And this is, because I'm the soils person, earthworms are kind of my thing. This one's a little odd, and you may have heard about it on CBC, or uh, it's been out with some of the um, hort societies and uh, master gardeners and such. And these are these jumping earthworms. Sometimes they're called Asian jumping worms. Um, they're native to East and Central Asia, so Korea, Japan, China. They came to North America actually a long time ago, and they've been gradually moving north, and they've been found in the Midwest and the Northeast states since about the mid-60s. More recently, the first ones were found in Ontario in 2014, just outside Windsor, and they've expanded since then to be found near um, Hamilton, Toronto, and Wheatley last year. And the thing is that they've been moved through garden mulch, through plants. There's a thought they may have got moved through bait, but they don't make good bait, which is kind of an odd thing. I think they may have just got mixed in with some other worms. And believe it or not, a few years ago, you could order them online because I remember cautioning somebody not to do that. So um, the thing about them is that they're different. They look a lot like our dewworm, but they're surface dwelling. So our dewworm, is a vertical burrow dweller, single burrow, whereas these guys live in the surface, kind of the uh, interface between the residue layer and the soil layer, just in there. Uh, they're self-fertile. They can actually reproduce at least once in our summer, uh, possibly more. Their life cycle is about a year, so they're going to die with our winter, but they're hatchlings. Um, juvenile worms when they emerge out of the cocoons can reproduce in 60 days. And so right now, if you were looking actively for them, you're not going to see them because they're going to be these really tiny juveniles. And then the adults will show up more late spring into summer. And then the cocoons will get laid in the fall. And you can see we've got a variety of sizes of cocoons. They're very small, but the size of a mustard seed. So what Denise was talking about, about cleaning boots, is kind of important because they could easily tag along. And 
the critical thing is they do look a lot like our European nightcrawler, our dewworm, but there are some significant differences. One is that they do thrash and they'll thrash enough to break off their tail. Um, they also have this uh, clitellum that's a little bit different. It's smooth with the body and fairly close to the head and it's also white in color. So that is kind of one of the critical pieces to be able to tell the difference. And so what's the big deal? They look a lot like a dewworm. Well, the problem is that they do live in that surface um, interface. So they actually rapidly consume all that surface residue. We already have problems in forested areas with the dewworm consuming residues and being invasive. Because you got to remember, all our earthworms are immigrants. They've all come in at some point. And if you're into forestry, you'll talk about the nightcrawler as being invasive. The other challenge with them is they have a really high reproduction rate. There is a suggestion that they change the soil structure. When they eat all of that residue, they change the aggregation and that may increase the erosion potential. And it certainly looks like they're breaking down the lignans a lot faster. So the concern is particularly in forests, gardens, and possibly some of our ag lands. We already have residues that break down very quickly. Uh, because of the moisture that we have. So they may become a problem. Right now, they're not generally in agricultural fields. Where they've been found is usually gardens and um, edge of homeowner type of locations, not so much in farm fields. So that's that one. Hannah, would you like to go next? For sure, I can do that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I was double checking. Apologies for my slow computer. There we go. I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly since you do have a detailed handout. Um, there's a couple of pests I wanted to bring your attention to just this afternoon. Um, and the reason is, is one of them is a, is a new introduction to Ontario. And the other one is a pest that um, we hope won't make it to Ontario, but the reality is given um, its biology and its distribution at present, it probably will end up here. Um, and they're both, insects that um, are, are distinct um, and um, they're, they're ones that we hope you uh, are looking out for. And if you do find that uh, you'll either let us know or let the Canadian Food Inspection Agency know. So the first one is this box tree moth. This is an insect that um, is native to Eastern Asia. It was introduced to Europe about 15 years ago and it spread very rapidly. Um, it is a boxwood specialist, which means that that's what it feeds on. It doesn't have a big host range. So uh, this is one that if you happen to have boxwood um, on your property or your parents or, you know, somewhere else that you're looking in a park, um, if you see this pest, it's, it's, um, it's one that uh, you need to take note of. Um, and unfortunately, this is an insect that showed up in Ontario um, a few years ago. Um, there's been a lot of uh, effort by the University of Guelph, OMAFRA, industry, the U of T, um, I'm probably missing a few, uh, to understand the biology of this pest, um, understand what it looks like, how to control it, um, and look at its distribution. So, um, this is an insect that has a complete development. So eggs, larva, pupa, and adult. The eggs are things you're not likely to see. It's the caterpillar and its injury that you're really likely to see. The larva um, at maturity are quite large. Um, they grow to be about four centimeters in length. They're green, these black stripes. Um, and they're, as you can see, it's this picture in the middle left. 
they're really a distinct looking um, larva. The pupae you may not see, they're hidden between leaves, they're um, often mixed up in, um, in um, webbing. You can see that the larva forms webbing as well. And then the adult are these um, quite lovely, um, delicate looking moths that are about four centimeter wingspan. Um, they're this lovely iridescent uh, white with the fringe brown at the margins. Um, there are two generations per year in Ontario right now. The larvae, uh, they overwinter as a small larva and a protected uh, hibernaculum. They are active starting around May, they're active to September, and it's the larvae that feed. And there's two big feeding periods. Most of the feeding injury um, happens um, earlier in the summer with that um, overwintering generation that completes its development. Um, so just in terms of the injury that we'd love you to take a look for is they feed on the leaves primarily, they will feed on the bark of the plants, but you're likely to see that uh, feeding on the leaves. The small larvae have uh, a small little mouth parts and they feed on uh, one side of the leaf, they'll remove one layer um, of the um, of the um, sort of the outer layer of the leaf, but they don't go all the way through. They don't form holes. So it's like a window pane. The large larvae, they have bigger mouth parts and they will chew those, those leaves, leaving the, um, the veins and things like that behind. And they are a manageable pest. So we have uh, BT uh, products that are registered um, for them. Um, so some of the signs of this, if you're seeing bushes that are defoliated, heavily go and take a look at them if you know what boxwood looks like. Um, you should be looking for uh, the webbing that they produce. It can produce quite a bit of webbing. It's often hidden. Um, that window pane injury, defoliation, and browned canopies. And you may see the, the larvae, you may see the frass in there. So be aware that's one you can help us look out for. And there is, a, 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 there is monitoring for this insect using pheromone traps. Um, in Ontario, um, and as well, they have uh, them in BC and Quebec, I believe, where they haven't been identified yet. Um, but we're trying to get a better sense of where these insects are in, um, in Ontario. And right now, um, this is a map that's been compiled. It's actually from my naturalist, um, sightings that people have reported. So um, social media really important for um, reporting. We found um, that pests show up there, especially ones that are visible. So you can see the distribution of this. So it's mostly the GTA, but it is spreading. Um, and of course we don't have traps everywhere. So we would really appreciate your help with this one. Um, the next one I wanted to cover um, is the spotted lanternfly. It's a very showy insect. Um, this is a, a plant hopper. It has feeding sucking mouth parts. It's a swarm feeder. You often see it in large numbers. You can see this is a very bright showy insect. The adult is big, it's bright, it's spotted. Um, this is another introduced pest, it made its way to Pennsylvania and it has been spreading ever since. It's been found in multiple states, um, including New York. So it is just across the border and it is a threat to agricultural and forest industries. We're particularly worried though about grape because this insect is not a fruit feeder, it feeds on the plant itself. Um, so the, um, the green tissue, vegetative tissue, um, and um, it has killed grapevines um, with its feeding. So because it's the sheer numbers of them, it's a swarm feeder. So that's a picture of the um, adult, the top and the middle, and that um, reddish black individual with the white spots is, um, is a late in star nymph. It's a regulated pest in Ontario. Um, one generation per year is what we would expect to find here over winters as an egg mass. So if you know what um, LDD moth, which is uh, formerly gypsy moth and now spongy moth, has an egg mass um, that is somewhat similar and it is an overwintering life stage. This insect here has one generation per year um, and the, um, the egg is the overwintering stage. And that's also a problematic stage because the females will lay their eggs on pretty much anything. Um, they're not picky and those eggs can get moved around very, very quickly. So that's how this insect gets moved uh, over fairly large distances. Um, it does have a preferred host, which is the tree of heaven, also an invasive. It is uh, fairly widespread in the Northeast, um, in the US and Canada. So it's not the only host, but it is an important host and it's a great host to be aware of uh, for surveying this insect, because although it this insect likes to feed on lots of things. It does, uh, it does like Tree of Heaven as well. Um, I've mentioned the fact that it's a swarm feeder, so it's a sheer numbers of them. You can have thousands of individuals on a plant at any given time, and that's that feeding um, basically compromises the health of the plant and prolonged feeding um, can kill it. 
Um, I've shown you a picture of the egg mass, like a cartoon of it. Well, this is what these egg masses can look like. Um, and they do age over time. They kind of have a putty appearance on the beginning. Um, and again, uh, it's present across the border. So it's something to be aware of. Um, there is a distribution map from February. Um, and if you find it, let somebody know, okay? If you find a suspect, because I think this one's gonna show up first on so social media, um, but uh, I hope not. And I hope we do find it um, in the early stages of invasion. Thanks. Great, thanks, Hannah. Yep. We just have another quick update from Kristen on water hand. And hopefully you can um, hang in with us for a bit longer. Sorry about that, everyone, that we're going over. Can you see my slides? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so water hemp. Um, this is a, a pretty new invasive uh, plant to Canada. Um, it came in, we suspect, in Ontario in the early 2000s on some equipment uh, purchased from the U.S., the southern U.S. states, and similarly in Quebec in 2017 from the purchase of a combine. And it's been spreading rapidly ever since. Um, so it is very prolific. It can produce up to, it is in the amaranthus uh, family of weeds, which also includes things like red root pigweed, green pigweed, tumble pigweed, prostrate pigweed, all the different pigweeds, <laughs> okay? Um, it is a little bit different though, because it is a, a dioecious species, which means that it is, has both male and female plants, similarly to Palmer amaranth, which um, we, we've, there has been um, sightings within Ontario, but there's never been um, development or distribution of that, but it is, it is widespread in the United States. For, so we're waiting on seeing that one as well, but let's focus on water hemp. Like I said, up to 1 million seeds per plant. They're very small. They look like any other pigweed seed. Um, it has um, dormancy of about five years, um, but it does have late germination in the growing season. So after when most um, post-immersion herbicides would have been applied and it does continue to germinate well into the fall. It has very fast growth. Um, it can grow upwards of four inches a day in the heat of the summer. And most herbicides are ineffective. All herbicides are pretty much ineffective past the 10 centimeter stage of the plant. So once it's identified, you must get those post-emergent herbicides on. Hopefully it matches the crop growth staging. It's very easily confused when it's smaller um, with other other problematic, uh, less problematic pigweeds, particularly green pigweed, because both water hemp and green, green pigweed have hairless stems. Um, this, the dioecious nature, or uh, because of the male and female plants, it has tremendous genetic variability, which helps to accelerate resistance development. Um, in the United States, um, there are populations of water hemp that are resistant to um, eight different herbicide modes of action. Within Ontario, we have just confirmed um, populations with resistant to five different modes of action. Okay, so here is um, the newest map that we have. You can see in red there, um, these are the populations and these populations have been found in these counties that have um, five-way resistance. So the herbicides group two, nine, uh, 14, and five. Um, and then we have populations that have different um, uh, multiple resistances. So to four groups of herbicides, um, we have two different populations, some that are only resistant to the group two, nine, 14, and 27, and others that are resistant to group two, five, nine, and 14. Um, then we have some populations where there's only resistance to uh, three or two groups, but there hasn't been one population that's only been resistant to one mode of action. So all of them are multiple resistance. So when you're managing water hemp in the province of Ontario, you're managing for resistance. Here you can see what it looks like, similar to a lot of other pigweed species in the four leaf stage. Here is a, a picture of um, the male plant shedding pollen above the canopy. And here's a picture of a highly infested uh, soybean field. There are soybeans in there, but 
uh, you can't see it for the water hemp. So this is one um, that we have found in a few vegetable crops so far, in, in peppers as well as in asparagus. And as you can see um, in horticulture, we rely primarily on about six different herbicide groups. Um, so if we do get water hemp widespread in horticulture, we will have very difficult time controlling it um, using um, just cultural practices we won't have any herbicide tools. So problematic, this is definitely one if you see in the field to remove immediately if you have a small area. Here's a picture of um, water hemp. It's here in the background in a pepper field. You can see how it kind of camouflages itself. And this is it against red root pigweed. It's more easily um, identified differently from red root pigweed than green pigweed. Here again, here's water hemp in, in a soybean field, very easily camouflaged and it's in the foreground here compared to the red root pigweed. Now in your materials, there is a pigweed species identification guide, which has more um, pigweed species in it and some of the key things to look for to identify it. But if you are unsure, you can always get it tested. Um, in my previous presentation, I only spoke about resistance testing, but we also have um, an amaranthus species or pigweed species identific DNA ident identification test. So you can send in leaf tissue and ask for identification and um, we can let you know what pigweed species that is if you're really unsure. Um, like, like I said, when they're very small, um, pictures are really hard to identify the difference between the species. So wow. that's all I have on that one. So watch out for that and get the growers to remove it if there's only a few, please. <laughs> all right, thanks, Kristen. Are there any questions on the invasive species presentations before we call it a day? Okay, I don't see anything yet in the chat. Again, my apologies. I my apologies for running over. I guess I wasn't in a very good chair today. <laughs> but thanks for everyone who stuck in with us and um, for participating in our intro to IPM training. Thanks to my colleagues and Elizabeth Buck for sharing their knowledge today. I hope you enjoyed the workshop and you learned a lot. If you do have any further questions for us, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I did provide all our contact information in your, in, um, your handouts. Uh, don't forget to sign up for the crop specific um, scout training workshops if you haven't already done so. And in the chat, I did put a link um, to a survey that you can fill out on how we did today. We would love to hear your feedback. I will also share that later on um, in an email and, um, with, and also with a link to the recording for today, because some people um, might have had to leave early. Okay, so thanks a lot and hope you enjoyed it. Bye for now. Happy scouting. <laughs>